Welcome back, dude. Thanks, man. Happy I don't know how many here. times you've been on. A few now. A few. Uh, and for those listening, we'll put those few in the show notes at <laughs> lukestory.com slash ian2, which is spelled like Ian, pronounced Ian. lukestory.com slash ian2. There's been a bunch of them. Number 300, 350, 465, 461, and we just did another one with Shazam, Philip. Shazam, man. Yeah. So this is number six? Something like that, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's like the Five Timers Club on SNL. I should get like a smoking jacket or something. (laughs) There should be some consolation prize of some sort. Definitely like a Luke Story insignia or something. But I think, I don't know, there's some people that come on and I feel like we nail the essence of them and their their wisdom in one shot. And it's kind of like just a one magical moment. And that's enough for everyone. Maybe not for them, but for me. (laughs) 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 Maybe for many of them, they're like, never again. Um, but I'll keep practicing until I nail it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I don't know. There's you and John Laurence and a few people that, you know, will hit me up. Like, you're like, Hey, I'm going to be there with Philip. You want to do another one? It's like an instantaneous. Yes. Cause I know I'm never going to get to the bottom of the well of your, Oh, that's awesome. Man. Your, Thanks. your intellect and your heart. And you just have so much knowledge to share. So, yeah, well, this is, I mean, this is fun and all the stuff you're doing. I mean, I said this off camera, but I totally support everything you're doing. And I mean, getting the information out to people and showing them like with integrity, showing them things to look at and do is rare and it's good. I mean, people need that. They need a voice that they can hear and trust. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate it. For sure, man. I That's mean, enough. I know that uh, my life has been absolutely transformed by the books I've read, the lectures and conferences I've attended, but probably more than anything is audio programs. Listening to thousands of hours of David Hawkins and Mm -hmm. Ram Dass and um, and podcasts with health experts and scientists and physicists and biologists and all of these people in different areas of study. I feel like that's given me a PhD in life, not to mention hosting the show for eight years and talking to people like you and be able to ask every weird little nuanced question I've ever wanted to ask someone. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when we first met, I, I asked you about why you've done this and you were like, are you kidding? This is the best gig ever. I get to talk to like the coolest people who are the top experts in their field in all of the world. Yeah, that's pretty cool. As it's, gigs go, that's a really yeah. good one. And in the beginning, I, I actually, I ran into uh, this guy, uh, Parangi, yesterday, a really great musician, and he's going to come on the show on Saturday. And um, he's like, oh, what's it like to do a podcast? Like, why, you know, why have you been doing it for eight years? And I said, well, there's no way I could get the people that I have conversations with to sit down and give me like a private coaching session for two <laughs> hours. You know what I mean? It's like... I mean, of course, I'm thinking about the audience, but I really like to learn all this stuff. So if I sit down with you or uh, Joe Dispenza, I'm mm-hmm. like, I mean, I might be able to get a conversation with you for free, but not someone that is highly sought after, or Gabor Mate yeah. or different people I've talked to. They don't have a thing on their website where you can sign up for a private two hour talk. No, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of a glutton for punishment because, and I legitimately still do this. It takes me a little while, but I tell everybody, you know, I, I'm still accessible. That's the reason I'm here is to try and help. So, you know, reach out. I'm on social media. It might take a little while because there is kind of a long list of people that, you know, hit me up with biological issues and problems they can't get through or this or that. And I 100% get back to you every single person. Takes a little while sometimes wow. because there is a litany of people. But you know, that's the thing is I just view it as like, I have a very oddball and specific skill set, And I kind of feel like we're all gifted with certain tools, right? And so my attributes are kind of in the way of, you know, being able to biologically suss things out. And as you say, you know, like a pattern recognitionist, see things that other people aren't necessarily seeing. So if I needed help, I would hope that if somebody else out there had the capacity to do that, they would, you know, lend the helping hand, you know? So it's, it's, I mean, it's just literally scratching my own itch, right? Like you you treat other people the way you want to be treated, you know, you know, and I keep beating this drum because I really believe it, but it was said a long time ago and I think it's true, but be the change you want to see in the world, right? Like I wish people reached out and helped everybody out more, you know, and it, surprisingly, a lot of people do like, you know, if I called you and said I needed something, I have no doubt that you would do it. And I would do the same. Likewise. It's just, uh, my grandfather said this when I was a kid and I didn't, I wish I had really caught the import of some of the things he told me when I was little, because it just, I just wasn't at that point, but he said, be good and do good. The rest will take care of itself. 
It's very simple, but it's it's as true today as it was, you know, 40 years ago. Sometimes the most uh, profound truths are so simple on their face that it's difficult to even apply them. Yeah. Because they just kind of pass you by. Like something like that can sound very trite, but if you actually, yeah. <laughs> right? But if you <laughs> if you actually take that data and apply it to your life, you have a fucking amazing life. I know, man. It's you know? what we were joking about earlier. And this one, one of my friends, Bill, and I were talking about this earlier in the week, is is that uh, Ramana Maharshi thing, you know, like, how do you treat other people? There are no other people. <laughs> like, it's best. so fucking poignant. I mean, yeah. if you realize that you're no different than anyone else in at, at the most fundamental level, so just do what you can, you know, the rising tide raises all vessels, right? Like, yeah. help everybody go up a little bit. And there, there is a surprising amount of that in the world, right? If you focus on the negativity, the negativity grows. If you focus on the positivity and the benefit, that grows too. It's basic physics, right? Like wherever you place your energy, that system is going to propagate, right? It's it's photoelectric effect applied to consciousness, right? You you point energy at something, that something expands. It hops out into, to the next level. I was having a conversation with my dad earlier in the week because he is sometimes... <clears throat> perhaps not the most optimistic of sorts. And I would say maybe more like the harbinger of doom, you know, like, oh, I just won the lottery, the taxes, you know, <laughs> it's like no matter, no matter what it is. And, right. he, and he knows it, we joke about it because he has kind of a tendency to do that. But I said, look, Pop, take 60 seconds, just for me, write out a list of 10 things that you see that are beneficial in the world. I don't care what they are. 10 things that are beautiful, you know, whether it's a tree, a rose, a cloud, doesn't matter. Just focus on the positivity because we're lambasted with so much negativity all of the time that I think the only way to really grapple with that is to not necessarily try and fight it, but to just look in the direction of the positivity. You know, Jesus didn't say like, you know, go forth and beat the hell out of people who are doing evil. He was like, you know, just turn away from evil, right? Same thing with Buddha, Krishna, all the guys that really kind of got it. They're not embracing negativity and clashing with it. They're just turning away from it and focusing on the positivity. And when you do that, positivity grows. See, if I followed that, my Telegram channel would be dead. <laughs> 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 For those of you that, that want to focus on the negativity in the world, I invite you to go to loopstory.com slash telegram. I know what you're speaking to is is really important and it's so true. And it and it's honestly, I'll be real, it's something I struggle with. I think it's something that anybody who is aware struggles with. And part part of it is, I think, because I've, you know, a life left unexamined is a wasted life, right? So I, I look at myself and my motives and try and check my behavior and habits and refine my character and all of that as I go. And one characteristic I have in a very pronounced way is I just want to know the truth about the nature of reality. And it's one of my highest values. Even if the truth that I find about myself, especially, and the world out there, uh, even if it's disturbing, I'm just, uh, it's in my nature. I just want to know, even if it hurts. Like, give me the bad news. I can mm -hmm. take it kind of thing. And I just want to understand the way things work. And so sometimes that leads me down paths that are really disturbing. You start looking at chemtrails and harp and mm -hmm. these biological weapons that are now in the vast majority of people on earth. And I mean, there's some really dark stuff out there. And I feel like, A, I want to know just out of like curiosity and just my it's just fascinating to watch the human experience and, and all the deviations on both sides of the polarity of this duality in which we live it's just like whoa god people are capable of this level of evil that's fascinating yeah. a b i want to sort of like brace myself and be aware of what dangers to avoid in the world and i also i think it's important for some of us to sound the alarm for people like hey did you know that cereal you're feeding your kid is full of glyphosate could be a problem you know <laughs> so it's like I want to know truth. I want to share that truth. But there's also the, you know, the limbic brain that is addicted to problems and addicted to drama and is the guy who's sitting there scrolling these really dark telegram feeds. I'm speaking about myself, like <laughs> looking for all the bad news and evil in the world, right? You know, or you could just embrace it. You know, I'm going to launch a whole line of cereals called Glypho Crunch. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Three exactly. times the glyphosate in every bite. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And you will grow no weeds inside your gut.
or anything else. So yeah, yeah it's something it's something I struggle with uh, a bit, to be honest. And and one of my resolutions this year was to loosen my grip on the negativity in the world and the bad news, and and focus more on envisioning and manifesting the kind of life and the kind of world that I want. So thank you for that reminder. Yeah, I I mean I struggle with it too. I think anybody who's reasonably aware will see things that that I think are arguably designed to be jarring to us because people want websites and things to be sticky, right? Because if nobody shows up on social media, it's no longer social, you know? And if you don't play into, you know, whatever the the trend is at that particular moment that tries to absorb your intent, you know, your focus, your entire being, you know, then they, they lose out on ad revenue. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's really right. what drives a lot of this. Um, so for me, yeah, it's, you know, I'm aware. So it's, it, it is a struggle, I think for anybody, because you care about other people and you don't want to see them, you know, like running very, very much into a giant meat grinder, which is unfortunately on a kind of a global scale, what ha has been happening to a lot of people, you know, at, but I, my take is kind of like yours was, I'm just trying to pull back and focus on what I can focus on and change that. I was talking to one of my, uh, one of my kids last week and he was saying that, you know, he's kind of on a, you know, his own spiritual path, right? And he's kind of working on meditating and doing those sorts of things, which I, I think that's fantastic. I, you know, I really applaud, especially at his age that he's doing that. Um, but he thought, you know, oh, maybe I should go out and try and do more social things outside and kind of impact things societally. And I said, actually, I think just the opposite, the fundamentally stabilizing your own awareness and your consciousness in a space of positivity is the most impactful thing you can do. You know, that's why like in TM, that's the reason, you know, cosmic consciousness is, is cosmic, right? Because it's a, not just a cosmic event, it's of a select celestial order of magnitude. Like the jump when your consciousness elevates to the point where it actually hits stability and is no longer, sh no longer shakable, a lot of things change. I mean, you, you like listening to Hawkins, most everybody here has probably heard him, but part of the reason for that is once you move over that threshold where you go beyond 600, just like light becomes coherent to make a laser, your voice becomes coherent when you speak. And so people are drawn to listen to it because there's a certain amount of integrity and focus and force behind it that they won't experience other places. They might just recognize it as, oh, this is comfortable. I want to listen to this. I enjoy this. But there's a different intensity behind it. And it, it is, you know, I mean, you've heard me say this, it's, it's the difference between a light bulb and a laser is one is incoherent and flattering around in different directions and you can warm a hot dog. The other is entirely coherent and focused with one point of intent and it will punch a hole through steel. Same number of emissive photons, but the outcome is entirely different and that's completely within our control, right? If you elevate your own consciousness, then you're able to do all of these other sorts of things with a fair degree of ease that other people would find completely intractable. And it's because you've increased the amplitude of what you are as a, as a waveform. That's beautiful. Tell that to all the people out there with their protest signs, hating the others that are doing it wrong. You know? Yeah, man. It's like, it's like people worry about what color the shark is wearing lately. Like, does the shark have a blue bib on or a red bib? It doesn't matter. You're in a pool with a shark. It's going to eat you. You know, like this divisiveness takes people away from focusing on the issues at hand, which there's, there's sort of a larger classicist thing that's happening, you know, where if people really understood the separation between the haves and the have nots and kind of like the old school proletariat bourgeoisie, you know, separation, uh, I think they would be far less inclined to fight amongst one another and far more inclined to say the system is obviously broken, but the system is no different than the system has been for probably the past 10,000 years. It's basically all governmental systems are outcroppings of mercantile feudalism, right? The people who control the flow of goods and money control the planet. That's not changed, you know? I mean, whether totally. they're kings totally. or merchants, that's the same gig we've been playing by. 100%. There's a book uh, that my friend Alex Zek turned me on to maybe a year ago. It's called um, The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose, who I'm in talks with. He's going to do the show. He just lives in Arizona, and I don't like doing remote interviews. He's got a film out called uh, Mr. Jones Plantation. Uh, by the way, it's a, a dramatic film, but it's based on reality. But the whole premise of the book is, is that no matter what type of government you have, if you look at uh, the historical record, 
ultimately, because of the issues that you just outlined so eloquently, ultimately that government, no matter what stripe uh, it is, blue, red, whatever, um, is going to start to devour people. You know? <laughs> and it's like, yeah. the premise of it essentially is that what leads us astray as a species is this superstitious belief that one human being or class of human being has an inherent right to rule over, control, exploit, subjugate another. <laughs> and it was just, I read that book or listened to it and was like, oh shit, that's right. We're, <laughs> we're all under this hypnosis that, you know, a royal bloodline or a politician or, you know, the head of a corporation or anyone is somehow special and therefore has the right or can be voted into the right of controlling the destiny and outcome and livelihood and energy output of another person. It's like, why do we even believe that? Why do we outsource our, our power in that way? I, I think outsourcing our power is the exact answer to that question, is people want to believe that the answer is outside of themselves. Right. I've never personally seen something where the answer wasn't inherent to the question and where the answer of anything I had been trying to figure out wasn't internal, period. You know, all the external battles, you know, whether it's, you know, your livelihood or anything like that, it, those those external things are irrelevant. And, you know, people will argue that point. And, and I suppose you, you can in a sense, but I really, in my own experience, everything is internal, right? Once you squelch the internal strife, the external stuff just kind of falls away. Things line up right? It's again, I think it's that coherence because it, from a fundamental, you know, basis, just looking at the sheer physics of it, right? You as Luke's story are an integrity of vibrations, right? You, you were a pattern that's oscillating in a certain very, very complicated way. And my particular belief is that your consciousness has manifested those aggregate vibrations around you to then coalesce and become things that are tangible and meaty, you know, so we can walk around, you know, in, in the physical form that we do. But really, e even things like histamine reactions or sickness or whatever, all that stuff is just, it's a physical manifestation of something that's amiss internally. And again, I'm sure I will catch a lot of flack for saying that, but that's actually my experience because I've seen things that with the current understanding wouldn't be believable, right? Like eliminating people's histamine reactions in real time, very easily done because you simply change the vibrations around them, then their own genetics express more fully and they have more integrity because basically you've taken the vibratory field that is the basis of that person, you amp up the amplitude of that signal. And so it's not as easily corrupted, right? So it's like a little bitty signal next to a very large broadcasting transmission tower, right? So you've got this, you know, megawatts of radio at one frequency and then a little bitty bitty signal. Well, that little signal is not going to do a damn thing to the giant megawatt tower. And so if you become that megawatt tower by virtue of constantly kind of refining your own internal process, you can hold up the integrity with everything else. There is no issue, right? You can't be damaged in the same way that other people can be damaged, you know, whether it's, you know, emotionally, physically, intellectually. It just makes you have a degree of imperviousness that, you know, isn't common, but it's completely plausible and doable for everybody. You know, you just have to work for it and earnestly want it. And also the phenomenon of someone who has that level of coherence having an impact on the living organisms around them Mm -hmm. who aren't even aware that it's happening and maybe aren't incentivized to do that work on themselves and develop that own coherence. But it's that entrainment, right? When you walk in, I don't know, for me, I think in the beginning it would be 12-step groups. It's a mm -hmm. great example of that, right? That David Hawkins talked about sure. a lot. It's you take someone, you know, this a vagrant off the streets with dreadlocks and urine stained clothing and you know makes their living diving in trash cans and stealing from people or something right and um are afflicted with probably unhealed trauma and alcoholism or drug addiction throw them in a consciousness field with higher coherence than they have on their own yeah. literally just from being in the room and in the field of the unconditional love of of those groups for example the person's instantly transformed yeah and become a upstanding member of society, you know, get back in touch with their kids, get a job, you know, whatever, right? It's like, well, how did that happen? 
it's some some kind of voodoo no it's the entrainment of consciousness yeah and then there's you know of course higher levels of that right you might go i don't know go to a beautiful cathedral or for me um i had a lot of that happen from going to kundalini yoga classes and workshops where it's like i'd walk in in one state do some mudras and sing some mantra and move my body around in certain ways and walk out being a completely different person. Yeah. You know, and even I love the the mountains. Right. You know, peaceful. Yeah. Right. I find that so interesting. And it speaks to what you were saying earlier about wanting to have an impact on the world because you're a high empathy, caring person. And it seems like to affect change, you need to go out into the world and start changing things and wrestling into your vision of what you think it should be. Meanwhile, if you just forgave your parents, call your mom, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> few of us want to do the the actual, the meaningful work. Yeah. Because it is a little more uncomfortable because you have to go within and kind of look at look at your shadowy parts and make those uncomfortable phone calls or have those conversations, do that forgiveness that your ego doesn't want to do. Yeah. I, um, and I, I you, you know, know, admit you were wrong, make amends yeah. to people you've harmed, right? Like the inner work and the work in your immediate relationships to me has been the most impactful. And I think as a result, I don't think I know as a result has absolutely made me a net positive Mm -hmm. to humanity, you know, to what degree, I don't know. But I I know that as someone who lived from um, a more rapacious uh, experience of life where I was taking energy from people and from the world all the time that I, I know that I'm a person now who does more giving of positive energy and has a positive impact but it's not because I'm trying to do that, it's just because I'm working on myself and I'm healing. And there's a certain level of coherence, plenty more to go, but there has been progress where- That's hard though. It's, it, it's hard know. to turn in and actually do that. And God bless anybody who really goes full bore because at the point at which things really kick in and you start to remember a lot of stuff, you know, I, I always, you know, people always wonder like, oh, what did I do in a past life? Who was I? You probably don't want to know because odds are at some point you were a complete asshole. So, you know, and, but at the point at which, you know, I think you actually start remembering that stuff and working through it, um, you've reached a space where you realize like, yeah, pretty much everybody does that kind of stuff. It's cool. (laughs) It's a cycle, right? Like love, acceptance, change, love, love, acceptance, change, love over and over and over. Because that's really like the substrate of everything that's going on is you have to be, in my opinion, um, you you have to be kind of grounded out in the space of love because that's been my experience of what this entire place is based on like the the frequency like the one frequency that is the root for everything in manifest creation in this particular universe is love which sounds you know super woo woo especially coming from a scientist but i will do things and you know and i and i do things routinely i was doing a podcast a couple weeks ago and before the show i was talking about how things were entangled and you know how you can affect change on other things and and the only reason i'm comfortable talking about it is because i can do it at the drop of a hat every time so i did the you know the thing with the coffee where i just had them put two cups of coffee in front of themselves and they were on you know milwaukee or somewhere and i said which one do you want changed and change the flavor of that particular thing because it's simply a vibratory function right and the idea that you're not connected to everyone and everything is not accurate it's kind of it's a very nice fallacy that people perpetrate on themselves but the reality is everything is entangled right everything is connected and everything is entangled it's holographic you know it's that that michael talbot book the holographic universe there's a lot of truth to that every component contains the information of every other component and when you shine a lot of energy through say a piece of a hologram you can really clearly see what else is going on most a lot of people i think don't really think about that but if you run that analogy thoroughly through like a holographic plate that everybody's seen that has an image on it when you shatter that no matter how small the piece is down to the single smallest tetrahedral molecule of silicon dioxide you take one molecule and you shine a light through it it recreates all of the information for the entire image and if you shine a laser through it which is entirely coherent you can actually create such a detailed image that you can actually get photonic scale resolution you can see where the electrons are i mean it really it's that precise and we tell ourselves like, oh, it's them, it's us. That's, I mean, truly that's just bullshit. But 
it's it's kind of the nice thing that we allow ourselves to work through and play and you know but at a certain point you've got to kind of wake up and make a call or like are you going to do something and stay and help or are you going to just check out and i think that's why a lot of people when they go through the process of kind of evolving themselves a lot of them probably end up in caves by themselves for a while and then a lot of them just die because you know kind of once you wake up and realize like there are no animals harmed in the making of this film <laughs> <laughs> it's like peace out bitches you know you totally. just you bounce you know totally. but then there's then there's the other people who are kind of like the equivalent of like bleeding heart liberals who are like wow that really sucked that was kind of hard i think i'm just gonna stick it out and try and help you know and then and those are the guys like i always owe a debt of gratitude to hawkins because he was kind of the thing that cracked the egg of me open um you know and that was a, a profound experience and i uh I don't, I'm sure it would have happened at some point anyway, but that was a trigger for me and it, and it really made an impactful difference. And also I think kind of helped me get to a point where I was like, okay, I want to help people. I really want to help people. What do I have to do to be able to do that? You know, and then start kind of aligning my life in such a way that I can actually elicit the changes that I want to do, you know, and on a larger scale. Cause at a certain point it's nice to do things kind of the microcosmic scale, but if you want to really make big changes, because there are a lot of, like you said, there are a lot of forces in the world that are not so warm and fuzzy that are trying to make those changes and they don't care who gets destroyed in the process, you know, and that's fine. But on the other side, you kind of need a counterbalance, right? So when the forces that are pulling people apart and being divisive, you need something that's being cohesive and trying to hold it together. And I do, I do actually think there's sort of a necessary interplay there, right? Like, if you were all good, you'd you'd want to have something that was a little dark because you need the dynamic interplay, right? Otherwise, people don't grow. So it's not it's not really at the grand scale so horrible because you need that dynamism. Otherwise, in a frictionless frictionless environment, you don't move much. <laughs> you know. I love that, dude. Um, yesterday, I did a podcast with a musician who goes by East Forest, and he makes these just music for psychedelic experiences um and some of them are made with recordings of ramdas speaking mm -hmm. and just waxing ramdas poetic and we were talking about um Get kind the of coolest voice <laughs> yeah the best dude even after his stroke you know you'd think like oh man and i think it took him a while to learn how to speak but um then he became very economic with his words and it's like you're hanging on every word because they really count because he couldn't get that many out you yeah. know but anyway we were talking about uh you know just the nature of reality and and duality and teasing apart ideas and so many things in this realm that i talk about are just directly lifted from david hawkins you know just ideas that i've played with but one of the most profound that we were we were talking about to to your point is how hawkins would talk about people that find fault with the nature of the world, right? And that we like, why does evil exist? And it's kind of like the, um, the atheist or agnostic argument. There's no God because there's war, because there's famine, because there's cancer, et cetera. And how Hawkins would talk about the idea that if the purpose of us incarnating here in these bodies that seem separate from everything even though we know they're not on a quantum level right as you described there is no other but we have the experience of other mm -hmm. because we need the individuality in order to progress consciousness moving forward but how hawkins would talk about that the world doesn't need to change look at the <laughs> war look at the famine look at the rape look at the murder like how can you reconcile that that's okay and in the only way i've been able to reconcile it, it is from listening to people like hawkins when he said if the purpose of us coming here is the evolution of consciousness, let's just just lay that out there as the best possible option, right? The thing that makes the most sense, because otherwise what's the point? Then the world exactly as it is, with all of its faults, is perfect for that. Can you imagine what right? a movie would be like if you did it kind of the other way where everything, there was nothing bad. It would be like, so I watched this TV show where people just sat down eating yogurt. You know? Right, <laughs> you know? I mean, right. Probably wouldn't get the best ratings, right? You know, yeah. they having a bland, tasteless existence at a, you know, very boring white table with no scenery. Eh, you know, this is way cooler. Yeah, it's it's like if if you if the goal is to reach a higher elevation, there needs to be the bottom of the mountain. 
Yeah. Otherwise, like, how do you get to the top? If it's all top of the mountain everywhere universally and everyone's there all the time, then what is there to do? Yeah. I'm kind of a big you fan know? of the idea that God is not an idiot, you know, that the universe isn't just foolish. You know, it's, it's very nice in how it kind of cordons things off, right? People who have the capacity to understand things are there because they have developed that capacity over time. People who have special attributes and abilities, they have those because they're not going to do something with it that's inherently wrong, right? You don't give toddlers pistols. You know, you, you very judiciously let people go through a test and once they've moved past a point and they can demonstrably be trusted with that knowledge and with those capacities, then you let them have it. But it's not, you know, that's why I don't get really racked out about people. There was a, a fellow I knew who was kind of, you know, like a big time spiritual teacher guy who was doing some pretty nefarious stuff. And I sent him a nice note about it because I didn't get terribly racked out about it. There are just certain things you don't do, right? Like you, there's a sanctity to having students, right? If you have students that you've taken under your wing, there's a certain covenant that's formed by the relationship of, you know, universe teacher student. It's sacrosanct. You don't fuck with that, right? Like you, you have a certain deference to that with respect that you just deal with a certain way. Um, but again, I, I'm not going to get racked out about it because even that guy, you know, he's a student in his own right. His consciousness is evolving. It's requisite that he fail. Most people fail tests the first time. That's just how this place is built. That's cool. You know, just keep yeah. doing it. Yeah, that explains the fallen guru syndrome. All the time, right? right? Like, they'll get it. It's just it's not It's actually this life. the exception if someone has, say, spiritual gifts and insights and kind of the magical powers of, uh, you know, having, being able to um, uh, do cities and stuff like that, right? Producing vibhuti or bilocating yeah. or... And there are a lot of people like that. Yeah, there's many people that have those gifts. And I think it's the exception when they aren't corrupted by the temptations along the way through that ascension into higher levels of consciousness. The ego is also still present there, kind of waiting in the wings going, ha, ha, ha. Now we're having fame and money and attention and adulation from followers. And those followers, uh, like Ram Dass would talk about how people would fall in love with him. You know, just because he's radiating love, but his love is, he's not radiating it for that purpose, but they just feel the energy of love and they attribute it to the persona right. and attach meaning to that and, and obsessively fall in love with him. Yeah, the ascription of form. Right, yeah. because he had integrity, I assume. Uh, there's been no uh, Me Too moments for Ram Dass, for example. I think I think actually, if I might, yeah, one of yeah. the things that that probably isn't publicly talked about there is... I bet there's a big correlation between people who have already hit the point of enlightenment who have come back and they might throw the scales there in terms of the way that's perceived. So they've already done it once and then they died and then they came back to help again. And those guys are going to probably go through the test pretty easily because they've already done it. Right. And that's going to, that's going to sort of skew it like, Oh, it's such an exception. Yeah. Well, because they passed last time. So they're most likely going to pass this time. Right. And, but people don't talk about that because it's not, right. it's not real cool to just so, go so blabbing about that. Maybe it's an exception and kind of a rarity that someone does ascend to higher levels of consciousness and spiritual power and understanding and is uncorruptible because the majority of them don't come back. Right. Right. You hit yeah. a certain level and you're like, oh, okay, earth school's done. Yeah. I'm going to go off to the celestial realms and be a guardian angel in the clouds for the people that are still here or whatever. Yeah, right. I mean, you're going to just chill out and modulate energy as it flows to this place and try and have a big spin on what happens. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, then there are those crazy people who are like, I'm going to jump back in. <laughs> Look, mom, no hands. I used to think that I was going to be one of those people when I hit that point and more and more, I'm like, ah, I'm probably good. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to keep climbing, you know, I'm going to keep ascending in my own little way. And the grace of God is going to help me to do so. But I don't know, man, the earth school is, it's a bitch here, man. I yeah, mean, this place it's, is hard. It's no joke. No, it's not. But that's the beauty of it, right? Is it is no joke. And it's, every bit totally real and that's your perception and that that's i mean that is the gift and the curse simultaneously is the beauty of this place is you 100 percent buy in right like when you take the contract to rock back in you know you're clubbed on the head you don't remember anything with rare exceptions and you have to work your way through the puzzle again and you believe it 
right? Like it's every bit as real. Yeah, the spiritual amnesia, the yeah. incarnation. I was Lacia Vidya. All right, I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but stress is a killer, literally. Not only does it lead to low energy, sleep loss, and irritability, but it's also a key factor in illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, and autoimmune disease. And with more than 80% of people saying stress is affecting their physical health, I'd say we've got a real situation on our hands here. Well, thankfully, our friends over at Just Thrive Health developed a way to safeguard us from the silent killer. And this one, I assure you, is truly safe and effective. It's called Just Calm. Just Calm's exclusive mood lifting blend is clinically proven to help you relax and breathe easier in as little as four weeks. It's chock full of a special mood biotic strain of probiotics called B. Longum 1714. And multiple clinical studies show that it helps you maintain balanced cortisol levels, promotes vitality, supports better sleep, and encourages a healthy mood. Just Calm's also formulated with three targeted B vitamins proven to help maintain gray matter and support optimal neurotransmitter function. So just punch up justthrivehealth.com and use the code LUKE20 to save 20% off a 90-day bottle. And Just Calm is designed as a companion to their amazing spore-based probiotic. And while the probiotic addresses the root cause of chronic gut-brain conditions, Just Calm busts through stress, and it really leaves me feeling cool and in control no matter what life throws at me. If you want the full details on what makes Just Thrive special, make sure to check out the Lifestylist episode 499. And for a steady, chill, more relaxed you, visit JustThriveHealth.com and use that code LUKE20 to save 20%. Yeah, I'm writing. Uh, I'm writing a book. I don't know if I told you that. No. And in one part, of it, the essence of the book is about loneliness. And um, in one part of the book, I'm talking about kind of the the meta analysis is that loneliness is just due to our lack of awareness of the unicity of consciousness and of humanity that there is no other that kind of thing, right? So, if you gain that awareness, you can't be lonely because you're you're not you. You're everyone all the time, right? But uh, along those lines, it's difficult because of that amnesia. Every time we're born again, I made a shirt, LukeStoryMerch.com, by the way, you can get it, and it says, born again, and 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 again, ad infinitum. It's like hilarious. Every time we, you know, we're up there in the ethers, wherever we are as a soul, and we're like, ooh, this person just met this person, and then, you know, we're kind of keeping tabs on them. This is just my imagination. I don't know if this out works. And then we're like, ooh, cool, they're falling in love. This looks good. They have the perfect karmic sort of blueprint for what I might need to come back in for another incarnation. Then you you know they have sex and you're like, boom, sperm just hit the egg. <laughs> you know, however long that takes, give it a couple days and whoosh, I'm jumping in there, you know? And then when you do that, the 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 moment, you know, gestation begins, it, it seems like you get this spiritual amnesia and you have no goddamn idea that you were here many times before. And it makes sense because we can't even hold this lifetime. It's too much. Right. Yeah. So it's like very few of us are able to hold the multitudes of lifetimes and contextualize those into our experience in this one because it's just too much i mean your brain can't even handle all that yeah i would say that hypothetically to hit the the first stage right like the point at which your consciousness breaks over um you have to purge all of the stresses that you've amassed this lifetime and you have to work through them like truly work through them which is brutal right like imagine the worst thing you've ever had like the worst day you've ever had the worst year whatever you have to work through that right so that's the first part but then to hit the second stage and kind of sublimate up to that point, you have to work through all of them. And so the idea of actually going back and reliving all of the stresses you've ever had from any lifetime and crushing through all, you know, probably 20 something of those to process that out, that's a bitch, you know, but that's what's required, right? Because then when you pass that point, then you're able to do different things and contribute in a different way. And I think, I think also it probably would allow you to check your own ego, you know, because you, you, you'd come back and build that construct again. So you could still relate to people, 
but you would no longer have the uh, the holier than thou thing because you'd realize, wow, yeah, there were a couple times where I was just, yeah, real not so good, you know, <laughs> and like, and it wouldn't be something that would be a second perspective. You would actually have lived it, and so you would really know that, yeah, you could be a complete asshole sometimes, right? Like, you will have murdered people. You will have been murdered. You will have raped people. You have been as horrible a creature as you can possibly imagine, but that's the path, right? And so in the process of seeing something that from your own perspective, you value and cherish, you, you know, your own persona and realizing, oh my God, this soul did all of these things. Wow, that's pretty screwed up, but still a good soul. So, hmm. you know, and then it kind of, it shifts that juxtaposition where you realize like, oh, well, I guess everybody else is going through the same thing, you know, and then it, it makes it a whole lot easier to not, not be so judgmental about something because you know firsthand that all the people who are you know doing those kind of like as you said sort of rapacious sort of things where they're pulling more than they're providing okay you know it's a cycle that's going to come around eventually hopefully they'll hit a point where they're contributing far more than they're taking you know and in the meantime what do you do do you hate on no not at all right you have been that person right just love them right provide provide energy because what else are you going to do it's a beautiful perspective and that has been part of my reconciliation with experiences in my life uh in which i was legitimately victimized which have been very few most of the things that i used to feel victimized about mm -hmm. upon honest inspection have been situations that i put myself in based on my own selfishness or stupidity <laughs> yeah you know but there were like being abused as a kid i mean there were a couple of things that have happened in my life that have been extremely detrimental and hurtful for which i had zero responsibility in this lifetime yeah and so reconciling that is challenging because it's like i was a little kid i was innocent i did nothing to invite the abuse for example but to the the thread we're on here I have found reconciliation through the understanding that, and this sounds like victim shaming, so forgive me anyone who's been abused and doesn't share this perspective, this is my own journey. I'm pretty certain that the things that were done to me, I had done before, and that there was a karmic debt left to be paid. And if, if I view it that way, and again, this is going to be a stretch for some that's people. A, that's going to piss a lot of people off. It's gonna, this is just my own understanding, man. You got you to gotta figure your own shit out, right? Yeah. And like, if, <laughs> if I'm looking back on things that happen, and it could be a rationalization or a justification or a way for me just to ease the, you know, the trauma response, but I, I don't think it's that because I've worked on this a lot for many years. And I really feel like I had committed some level of atrocity in prior lifetimes and that when i came in this time there was a debit there was a ledger that needed to be balanced and from that perspective i can find a much deeper level of forgiveness for the perpetrators because it's all part of this karmic cycle and yeah. they played a role in my awakening and in my undoing of that karma and the only proof i have of that i think is that I used to steal constantly my whole life. I was just a complete kleptomaniac because of my trauma and just whatever. When I got sober, obviously I stopped stealing. Not that everyone, actually, no, I didn't. That's not even true. <laughs> That's not even true. I, I changed the rules for who I was willing to steal from. So I'll have to correct that. And I made amends for the things that I stole after that. But I stopped breaking into houses and just doing super gnarly shit. And when I got sober, there was a period of time, a few years, where I got shit stolen from me constantly. Card get broken into all the time, just people stealing my stuff. That's awesome. Karmic yeah. Karmic balancing. Totally, dude. And then at a certain point, and I was kind of careless because I just thought I'm a good person. Why would anyone break into my car? Eh, I don't need to lock it or I leave shit on the seat or whatever, right? Then at a certain point, it stopped happening and I wasn't being any more thoughtful about securing my stuff or watching it or there was no like higher level of concern or care. And then it just stopped happening. And I thought, huh, this is interesting. After a couple of years of like no one stealing my shit, no one trying to fight me or just no attacks of any kind coming my way, I thought the only way to explain this, because I'm still living in Los Angeles, still in the same neighborhood, still parking my car wherever, right? 
my house is just as easy to break into as it ever was. And I thought I must have finally like produced enough goodwill in the world that I nullified or neutralized that karma. And now I, I don't have to have things stolen from me because the ledger is balanced. Yeah, I think there is a, a beautiful degree of complexity to it, but I kind of subscribe to the idea that there is an overarching balance in the universe. And, you know, when you work through those things, you, you have issues because you, you want to work through them, right? You want to become smarter. You study right? You want to become stronger. You push your body physically. That's like, that's what's requisite. And I don't think it's any different with, you know, the growth and evolution of your own consciousness. You go through strife, right? And I'm sure you did just balance it out. And that's honestly, sometimes when people are operating on karma cash, they'll do something and then they'll get slammed immediately. That's great. That means you're in a great spot, right? Like when it's not karma credit, where it's going to be a lifetime or two lifetimes before you reap that, you know, and that's, I think that's what throws people off is you reap what you sow. Yeah, given, but you sow a seed and you reap something that looks entirely different. What obfuscates that for people? The passage of time. If the passage of time is a season, it's really easy to say, oh, you reap what you sow. Yeah. But if the passage of time is, let's say a hundred years or 200 years, you're not going to have any experience of that because time has occluded that. Your soul recognizes it, but your awareness at that given moment is completely oblivious because it doesn't see what was actually sown at that point. Luckily, the universe seems to be really good at keeping, you know, keeping tabs of that and working that stuff out. So, I mean, to me, that's kind of a beautiful system because you do something beneficial, you get it back many fold. You do something detrimental, you get it back point for point, you know, which is like, pretty fair dude it's the most <laughs> fucking amazing asymmetrical yeah. balance you know it's beautiful right like if you do something detrimental point for point you do something beneficial tenfold cool i mean if that were an investing setup everybody in their right mind would do that you know it's it's a great gig have you ever had any conscious awareness of your past lives yes you have yes tell us more i would rather not okay, <laughs> so, okay. yeah yeah it it <laughs> yeah, it all came crashing back. And so, yeah. And, and that's the thing is I don't expect that anybody, you know, it, when it's meant to happen, it happens. Right. And you can't, you can't bypass it despite what you'd like to. I mean, there, there are certain points of, along the path of trying to evolve your own consciousness when it actually kicks in and you start moving through it. It's brutal. And like, and I, you can't even describe the degree of severity and pain. Like it's, brutal you know but 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 i mean i i think that's why why most people don't talk about it right because if you if you told everybody you know like if you told everybody just how truly brutal it was and how real it has to get and how excoriating it is personally because you do you end up stripping away your entire persona right like you lose that you end up rebuilding it so you can reintegrate with society or you just dip and check out but in the process of doing that and having it all stripped away it's super brutal. If most people knew just how hard they'd be like, yeah, I think I'm going to take the buddy Jesus path, you know, fuck this, you know, going for enlightenment thing. I'm going to go for salvation and check out the door. Cause it's a whole lot easier, right? Like the onus is no longer on you. You have somebody else doing a lot of the lifting for you, right? You're trying to end up at an entirely different point. If you're trying to elevate your own consciousness and your own awareness, you've basically signed up to go on a very difficult path that is going to take many, many lifetimes. And at the point at which it kicks in and you start actually hitting those spots where it locks in and doesn't regress, it's brutal, right? And the, the first one is bad. The second one is hard. The third one is literally the worst thing you can imagine. Like you, no matter what bit of darkness is within yourself, it will get blown up in a way that you could not even begin to fathom so that you have your own temptation and you have to move through it. And you know, the, the funny part is that's, that's the path that as far as I'm aware, everybody went through, you know, to get to the other side of that, nobody gets out unscathed. It's brutal. I think that's the funny thing about the spiritual path and the something about which many people I think are confused and rudely awakened is that the spiritual path is the hardest path. Dude, it's, it's, I brutal. mean, drinking beer, watching football, 
punching the clock at your nine to five for a few lifetimes. And God knows I've probably squandered a lot of lifetimes doing sure, some version of, of bread and circus, right? But I think many people, and this is, I think, true for me in the beginning, thinking, oh, spirituality, I start to meditate, do a little yoga, read some spiritual books. It's the it's the myth of love and light, right? <laughs> that the spiritual path is the path of inner peace and right. quietude of mind and calmness and compassion and all of those wonderful parts of the path. But in my experience, in order to get to those states and to have that state become more pervasive, it requires periods that you describe that are freaking brutal. Dante's fucking inferno, man. Tricky. I mean, it's just like, I don't know if I would have signed up for this if I knew it could be so hard to wake up. You yeah, know? I think that's I think that's designed. I mean, way. I would, right? I mean, I'm not I wouldn't take anything back, but it's just like, man, even all the progress that I've made, which is so much from where I started, there's periods that are really difficult. Yeah, I you know, it's funny cuz I am a very pacifistic person by nature, but one of the one of the big things for me was I literally ended up in a setting where I was contemplating murdering someone, which sounds horrible. I mean, and I, but that was, that was the temptation. And it was seemingly something that would have been entirely justified given, you know, the circumstance and all this kind of stuff. But that's the test, right? It's like, and what's preposterous is kind of looking back and looking at how many things had to line up to be able to elicit the kind of doubt and internal questioning to even hit that in in me was amazing it was like the most intricate billiard ball shot in the universe with everything conspiring to line up this one scenario at this one particular moment to be this kind of you know massive checkpoint you know where like you go this way you you move down an entirely different path you go this way woo, you know you go you go through the gates and you go to an entirely different thing but what was bizarre is just the degree of internally how much i thought well i would never do that kind of a thing there's there's not a mean bone in my body like that's not not at all how i roll you think that right but no matter how small that that pressure is it gets ferreted out right it's that that idea of what happens when an immovable immovable object gets pressed on by an indestructible force right well if there's no flaw in the immovable object, it can hold the weight of whatever force is placed on it. If there is a fissure, even at a subatomic level, the moment something of infinite mass gets placed on it, it explodes, basically at the speed of light. You know, And that's kind of those checkpoints for your own consciousness, that's what that is, right? You get placed under ridiculous degrees of weight to see where your mass is. You know, like what, what can you handle? What, what is the breaking point? And those are not, they're not easy. Like they really are not easy. Um, I don't know that I would recommend it to anybody. I would maybe say protract it out, take a couple lifetimes, just chill the fuck out, go slow. Uh, because I, I too was like, oh, I'm going to race for it and do all this good stuff. And yeah, it's that joke about the path of love and light. It sounds great, but when you really get into it, it's kind of harsh. I mean, one of the things I remember I was working on surrender, right? Surrender was one of the last things that was very difficult for me. And in our culture, like, you know, guys in the West, it's, you know, you think of yourself as like, oh, I run a company, I do this. Blah, blah. You, it's not something that you are prone to doing is to actually surrendering, right? So it took a while. It was really hard. And I finally reached a point where I thought, okay, I've surrendered, right? Like I have surrendered fully to God. That's it. I have nothing left to give. So I called our friend Todd and I, and I went to see Todd and I said, Hey man, that Sananga thing you do, right? Which is basically like capsaicin in the eyes. I said, I need you to do that Sananga thing on me because my thought was if I truly surrendered, then I have surrendered all, you know, attributes of form, all emotion, all physical sensation. It's no longer belongs to me. So I did that and had him, you know, put the drops in my eyes and the whole nine yards. And I don't know whether that was really completely there but when i got up todd was kind of surprised and he said i've never seen that like you didn't flinch you didn't move you didn't twitch your respiration didn't change and it didn't because i had truly hit a point where it wasn't mine right like this form didn't belong to me it was just it was just processing out some stuff so i wasn't attached to it right 
um, which was great. Like last year when I was in that motorcycle wreck, it was really nice because when my leg, upper leg bone, my femur ended up inside of my tibia, I was, you know, <laughs> cracking jokes with the EMTs and I had just face planted at 65 miles an hour and my bone was inside the other bone and it split it six inches down like a log. And if I had been really c tremendously attached to the sensations that were going on, it would have been kind of brutal, right? Like that's, you know, it's not the most pleasant of sensations. It was the, the only time that I kind of lost, lost that a little bit was when the, uh, the EMTs like accidentally hooked in on the side of the CT scanner and popped the bone out of the other bone, you know, I yelped. Um, but other than that, it, it, uh, you know, you just kind of, you let that stuff go, right? Like you truly have to surrender. It doesn't belong to you anymore, right? You're doing something in service to a much, a much larger thing. So you just kind of check your own self at the door and which, which is kind of an odd construct, right? Like you, you realize like, okay, I'm opting in. So I'm going to be here. I'm going to do this thing, but there's a certain component of it where you just kind of check a lot of stuff at the door and leave it behind you. So you're a scientist in the truest yes, sense. That is true. And over the years I've observed this, uh, I don't know, I guess just a pretty widely had perspective that on one side of reality, you have science and empirical evidence. And on the other side, you have spirituality and God. And there's been, you know, a few intersections of that where they've merged for certain people. But I think largely the people on the scientific side still discount spirituality. And in my perspective, true science is just a manifestation of spirituality. Yeah, so I agree. I'm, it's I'm a curious because you're one of the few people I know that is analytical, highly intelligent, a lot of intellectual prowess, but you're also deeply, you know, embodying spirituality. To you, is there an intersection or is it one thing? And how have you arrived at your level of understanding? It's one thing. It, it's all a quest for truth. You want to understand. I think actually one of the things where science goes off the rails is people, because of the interests that they hold near and dear, you know, it's that Upton Sinclair thing of you'll have a very difficult time getting a man to understand something he's paid to not understand, right? Very often there's uh, different forces at play. People think their livelihood depends on this or that or this or that. And because of that, they let themselves get pulled off. In the quest for science, you're trying to find an answer, right? You want to know how does something function? What is the truth behind it? And that's like peeling an onion, right? There are a lot of different layers to it. You know, if you had looked at physics, you know, 400 years ago, there's kind of the Newtonian approach. If you look at it 100 years ago, there's the relativistic approach, you know, and, and it gets more and more and more refined over time. I think you, you pull the thread and see what happens. In my case, I'll do an experiment and I'll see what happens. If the resultant data is something that's completely opposing to what I thought, okay, fine, I was wrong, right? Like I, I developed this gamma ray shielding a couple of years ago, and in my head, I thought it was going to work one way. Well, it turns out when I actually tested it, I had made a gamma ray waveguide. So I was completely wrong, right? Now, all I had to do was change one aspect of the configuration, and then it worked like the best gamma shielding ever. But... It was diametrically opposed, literally, to what I thought it was going to be. And if I had been all wrapped around the axle about it and said, oh, well, you know, I thought it was going to be this, then I would have been hosed, right? Like, I, science would not have advanced. I wouldn't have been able to do what I set out to do because my ego would have been all wrapped up in it. And I would have thought, like, oh, I'm wrong or, oh, I'm not smart. And, and you know, throughout my life, there's been a lot of that. You know, luckily now that's not really a thing, but... For the majority of my life, I was always trying to push, trying to be smarter and do more and do this. And now it's, I mean, I want to do those things and I push myself every day to have a better instrument to be able to do that stuff. Uh, but the, the reason I do it is different. And I think that's changed. But science is still just, in my opinion, 
a search for truth. And if you wrap your ego around it, you're going to get something that's less true because just like a lens, you want it as clean as you can get. You put jelly on the lens and you shine a light through it. Things are going to go wrong, you know, and if you shoot a laser through it, things are going to go really wrong, right? Like doing Kundalini yoga, great thing. Doing Kundalini yoga, if you're not going to really do all of the other parts of it, kind of hardcore, you might fuck yourself up because you're going to start flowing a lot of energy and it's going to come out sideways, you know, like in with most religions over the past couple thousand years, like Catholicism, right? If you try and say, okay, you're going to do all this meditation, you're going to do all this prayer, you're going to do all these things, but you can't have any physical sexual outlet. And by the way, we're not going to teach you how to, you know, swap this, you know, energy that you're building at your core and sublimate it to turn into something else. That's going to go real sideways. Just going to tell you, you know, there's going to be an unfortunate altar boy somewhere that's going to reap the negative consequences of those guys not knowing how to actually transmute that stuff because they didn't get the training, right? Like you've, you've got to fully understand that and move down, down that path. And, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get hurt. Kundalini is great, but energy always wins, you know, the, the push to become more and to evolve that's consistent. It's consistent in science. Most people think that science moves forward, right? I think that's a ridiculous misnomer. Um, it doesn't move forward. It's like people think the wind blows, right? The wind doesn't blow. The wind is pulled past you, right? We don't push our way into the future. We're pulled, right? Like It's like your consciousness. I always thought and, and this was my own experience until, you know, a couple of years ago was that like, oh, I'm climbing this mountain. I'm pushing my way up. I'm expanding my consciousness. Utter bullshit. Totally wrong. Right? Like I literally was clenching to the side of that mountain, trying not to lose myself, you know, like holding on to my ego as tightly as I possibly could. What you kind of realize is like when you let go, then you actually start to move up. The technology that gets expressed for humanity it gets expressed because it's meant to be there at that time. It's not like we're so brilliant pushing things forward. It's we're actually getting drawn into the future, right? That's why you see, you know, E equals MC squared occurs at two places on opposite sides of the earth because that thought form was out there and it needed to become manifest, right? So the thought form finds a person that has the technical capacity to kind of elucidate that concept and bring it forward. Now, I always joke about, um, my idea of reinventing the oval, right? Like every scientist I think has stumbled upon something and we're like, aha, look, a brilliant wheel, you know, but it's really, it's this totally wonky oval, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's not very smooth, but the odds are you're not going to find the ultimate form of what you're going after the very first time you see it. It takes refining over time. And I, I just know from my own personal experience that I have had things that are literally just dropped in my lap. Like you saw, you saw the fireproofing thing. I did that thing at my lab for you with the egg. Um, that I just dialed in and got the answer and I didn't even understand it. Right? Like it took me two weeks to figure out how the heck that worked. I literally wrote down the formula for what to do and how to make it, made it, tested it, worked like a champ blocked, you know, a millimeter thick layer blocked like 4,000 degrees, almost fantastically good. I had no clue how that worked. And what was funny is from a chemical standpoint, the the constituents of that, one was explosive, one was accelerant, you know, or an accelerant. It should have gone boom and like hurt me. But instead, it was like the best heat shielding material anybody had ever seen. I, I didn't have that knowledge, right? It was out there in the ether. I just was able to simply tap in and ask the question. And because I was using it for something beneficial, I was given the answer. But in truth, the knowledge was already out there. I just had the technical capacity to tap in, ask the question, and bring it forward. It's like that with everything, you know, Marconi and, Marconi and Tesla, right? Radio. It happens at the same time because it's meant to happen for humanity so we can move into the future. You know? Do you believe in the 100th monkey principle? Very much so, yeah. It's a density of consciousness. It's any wave form that reaches a certain degree of amplitude is going to propagate and when you reach the mass of enough consciousness, that will propagate and cascade across that entire system. Um, you can see that in the stuff that Rupert Sheldrake did, you know, in some of his experiments where, um, you know, mice on one component of the world, when you get them to move through a maze, then all of the mice in that same particular genetic lineage, despite where they are on the planet, they suddenly are 
they're they're aware when they're born with that knowledge just on board and it's because consciousness is pervasive i mean the idea of space is ludicrous like space isn't space right you're not separated by distance everything is connected it's again it's a really beautiful construct and we buy into it wholeheartedly but it's just that it's just it's a construct If you're a fan of this show, you likely have some knowledge of the concept of quantum energy. We've covered it a lot over the past few years. Put simply, quantum energy is the source energy that exists in literally everything. Every one of us constantly interacts with the quantum energy fields around us. What sucks, though, is that your energy field can be greatly disrupted by environmental toxicity and chaotic energy created by EMF. Well, thankfully, the innovative folks over at Leela Quantum develop products to strengthen and protect our biofield and even mitigate harmful EMF. But let's be real here. Anyone can make claims about quantum energy products because this energy is, by its very nature, invisible and therefore difficult to prove. What can be proven, though, is whether or not a quantum energy product has a positive impact on the body. To prove this, to solve this, Leela Q provides a grip of randomized, placebo controlled single and double blind studies proving the many benefits of their products. Of the various studies listed on their site, the dark field microscopy studies are some of the most intriguing. These studies demonstrate significant protective and improvement effects of the quantum block technology on human blood following only a 10-minute exposure. To feel the effects of quantum energy yourself, here's what you do. Go to leelaq.com and use the code LUKE10 to get 10% off your first order. That's L-E-E-L-A-Q, leelaq.com. Same thing with time. The time thing to me is really trippy because I, I, and I don't think I, it's unlikely I ever would have understood this without the help of psychedelics. So I'll just give credit where credit's due. But I have had the awareness at various times um, that like looking at my own life and experiences I've had and working on healing things and mm -hmm. whatnot that every version of myself from the moment I was born in this lifetime until I am right now are still present and within me. So people talk about doing inner child work and that you think on the surface, oh, I need to go back into my memories of what happened when I was five and I'm going to think about it in a different way from time right now in this moment. Mm -hmm. The time that I'm going back to using memory is gone and doesn't exist anymore, nor does that five-year-old. So it's all happening here in this moment as the adult version of me, right? And I've had so many experiences wherein I've realized in a very tangible way that that five-year-old me is absolutely still alive and right here right now, <laughs> like Russian yeah. dolls. I forget what they're called, mumoshka dolls or whatever, right? And it's like you start peeling them back and you're like, when do we get to the end? And there is no <laughs> end, right? And then you put it back together and every version of that doll is still there from the tiny little infant doll to the adult old man doll, right? Yeah. So instances like that, looking at my own life, have led me to the understanding that like all of that time is still present in this eternal now. And the only thing that gives us the illusion of time is just that because we're using the avatar body and all of our senses that we can only see and experience what we consider to be this moment and this now and therefore the now that was 10 minutes ago doesn't exist anymore right but it's only because we're just picking one time stamp on an eternal now yeah i would be inclined right? to say with that no beginning and yeah. no end the other parts there too yeah right so it's like whoa if everything is and this is just a thought experiment i don't want to get your interpretation of this but if everything is one eternal now and there's no past and there's no future. It's just an infinite expanse with no beginning and no end. Then living in the moment is actually impossible. There is no now because the moment you identify the now, it's already gone. Right? It's like nows are just gone, <laughs> gone, 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 right? So it's like you can't really live in the moment or live in the now if there is no time. So what can you, where, then where am I in time and space? I'm everywhere all the time because there's no location there's no distance there's no difference between here and there as you said there's no there's no space right and if there's no space and there's no time then man life gets really interesting and and more than interesting it becomes malleable and that's where yeah. i think we 
can move beyond the sort of empty platitude of like, you create your own reality, which sounds nice in theory, but how does that actually work? It becomes much more realistic. I think, I think if we throw is... time and space out of the equation and we realize like, holy shit, we, we really are creating every millisecond of our experience. Yeah, I would think that, you know, that's a function of consciousness. The, the stronger your consciousness, the more you can quite literally create your own experience and your own reality to, you know, if you want to turn water into wine, you want to walk on water, you want to fly, you want to do whatever. I think that's, you know, if it's something that you can imagine, depending on the level of your awareness and your consciousness, I would, I would posit that it is probably capable of being done. Um, the beauty of this, though, is you are separate, right? Like you're experiencing things is like, I love chicken teriyaki. I don't necessarily want to see myself from the perspective of the thing about to eat it. You know, it's kind of nice to actually have that, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like that separation. True. It's, true. It, this place is great. It's like, uh, it's like the ultimate, you know, family fun filled theme ride. Like you, you really dive in. That's why, you know, if you're going to be here and do stuff, just kind of pick which side of the fence you're going to be on. Are you going to play on the nefarious side? Or are you going to play on the fun good side, right? Like they both serve a purpose, you know, for my particular flavor. I kind of like the goofy, the goofy fun side, um, you know, where I can go out and make things and change people's bodies and do, you know, like do stuff to modulate that. That's, that's fun. The, the other questions there's, there are such a large order that I don't know that they're really relevant because it's a good intellectual curiosity but beyond a certain point, like, does it really make much difference, right? Like, if you're having a, a really seriously deep plant medicine experience, right, your sense of self goes away, your sense of temporality goes away, all that stuff dips. But you wouldn't want to be in that space all the time, right? Like, because this is really cool. Like, you know, I mean, Allison's downstairs. She's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, like, that's... Totally. That's, I mean, that's where it's at. Yeah. It's like the yeah. people in our lives that we get to experience it and walk through with. That's fucking great. That is like the best thing ever. Um, the rest of it's very cool, but I mean, I think you just kind of, you experience this and, and even in the, the more advanced states of awareness, they're great. They serve a purpose, but when you hit them, you have the option of checking out or sticking around. And you just make your call and run with it. At least that's my experience. And, you know, just, I, I very much like the idea that I, I actually have a persona where I get to interact with people. I think the, the other one is so disassociated, speaking again, truly from personal experience, it's so disassociated that you don't relate to people like at all. I mean, it just, it's, um, <laughs> It, you try. I, I don't know that I You're can cracking really, me up, dude. Yeah, I don't know that I can really eloquently say it, but I, you, you just don't relate. I, you just answered like a great question for me. There was a stage of my evolution where I felt hyper connected to other people, and just I don't know, like a really high degree of empathy mm -hmm. and really enjoyed being around people and crowds of people and it was just much more extroverted and over the past couple of years i have felt i'm just going to be real like more awkward around people and kind of i don't know i've never framed it as disassociated per se but just kind of in my own little world in a way and kind of less into people, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, I don't know, being happier by myself or just hanging out with Allison. And it's something that I've kind of thought, I don't know, I've sort of found fault with it. Like, man, I used to be like Mr. People guy. <laughs> like, you know, what happened? And um, yeah, it's something I've kind of just played with and tried to just understand to some level and because I've found fault with it, and I think part of it is just going through a phase of life where you know, the consciousness that I'm experiencing is kind of more insulated and a bit separate, you know? Yeah. And I don't, and maybe that's just okay because it's part of the journey, but it's something that I have struggled with. Like, man, why am I not like the gregarious like people person that I was just a few years ago. I don't really like being around a lot of people a lot. And 
one or two or three people is a pretty good number. And that's, you know, I like to go to parties or yeah. like go to concerts, like things that I used to really enjoy, like being around a lot of people and all of that. I'm um, just kind of in my own little like insulated space. And it's, it's, it's kind of weird because it's a new experience. I don't know. It's kind of beautiful though, man. I mean, you've, you've actually crafted a really beautiful existence, you know, from the outside. It's just, one way to look at it. Yeah. I guess yeah. it's hard for me to see it that way. Cause you can't really, it's hard to track your own progress and your own ev evolution because when you go through changes and just the way that you, um, 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 find your proprioception in the world as that changes, you only know it subjectively. So you don't, like someone on the outside might be like, wow, you're, you, you've really evolved. But my experience is like, have I devolved? Because <laughs> I don't, I don't feel that comfortable around that many people, right? There's a certain frequency of person like you, for example, I'm just like, boom, we could just hang all day. I feel yeah. totally at ease. Right. And then I get around other people who might be beautiful people and there's nothing wrong with them at all. And I'm just kind of like uncomfortable <laughs> in my skin and I'm antsy, yeah, you know? No. And if I'm around people who, are less evolved, uh, I, get, I get real antsy, you know, if people are still like really operating from their wounds and their ego, it's not a judgment thing, like I'm better than them at all because I'm fully yeah, aware of been, my own faults. Yeah. But if people are still shadowy, like it's real uncomfortable where I used to be able to kind of get in the ring with people that were still in their character defects or uh, their wounds. And like, as long as they were willing to kind of rise up and we could grow together, if mm -hmm. I could help them grow, like I could be in the ring with them without getting affected. And now I, I'm not as impervious to that. I really get affected by people who are still operating from their wounds or from ego. And it's just like so uncomfortable for me to be in their field. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I, I mean, I keep a very tight circle and, you know, I mean, I try and help as many people as I can, but I really do. Like, I don't get out a ton, you know? I mean, my, I mean, you've been to my lab. It's uh, like, it's kind of a, I wouldn't get out much if I had your lab either. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun awesome in there. Space. It is fun in there. Right. It's like yeah. a, it's like a mad scientist. Your blow place. torches. And yeah. Homemade hyperbaric chambers yeah. and all these, we haven't even talked about your products. I'm like, yeah, that's one of the main things I want to talk about. But um, anyway, so you don't you, you, no, I, I you relate kind of, to that sort of I like totally do because I I keep it kind of like a, a tight circle. You know, it's just it's it, not to say that there's anything wrong with all the other stuff. I just don't I'm not really driven to it. I mean, I'd be perfectly fine just being quiet off in some cabin in the mountains, you know, never uttering another word probably, right. I mean, which doesn't sound, you know, for, I mean, for as much as I'm, you know, out in public doing things seems kind of antithetical, but that's really true. Like I, I love helping people. I love being around people, but I'm really great. Just solo, you know, quiet and still. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I have, I used to have a hard time with that. Right. Like, meditating was like one of the most difficult things and it ended up becoming like my favorite thing in the world but it was brutally hard like people who don't do it don't really know you think like oh how simple you know you sit down you're right that's just at the outset it actually becomes very difficult right because you start to open up and then you start to have to work through all this stuff and it's hard but now it just kind of chill and very quiet and i'm good with that you know yeah i guess it just i guess it's like um it's like a calibration of your vessel, like as you go through the different stages of development, right? And when you when you hit a different level of development, and not to say that we can't regress, and I've regressed a million times, but there is a steady incline toward more um, coherence, right? More love. Yeah, I, really. I think that's kind of the the path that pretty much everybody who's signed on here is yeah. moving towards. But there are stages along that ascension that are uncomfortable by their very nature solely because of the unfamiliarity with that new uh, way of feeling and being, right? So it's like, there's a tendency for me to feel like something's wrong just because it's unfamiliar. Like if I'm like, we were out at a friend's land yesterday and um, it's a big piece of property and I was walking through the field to go to my car and I just had this overwhelming sense that I just want to sit here on a rock for a couple of weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to, awesome. I don't want to go on the freeway. I don't even want to come to our home, which is a beautiful, warm, loving space. I just like, I just need to be out here. I just want to look at the sky. I don't want to talk to anyone. And I'm like, 
it feels like there's something wrong with me for being that way. And so it's like a calibration of, oh, I guess I'm just, you know, going through the kind of changes where my being um, is, is, is better served with more, more solitude and more quiet which is a strange thing because when I was a kid, I lived in, you know, country ass towns and the woods and there wasn't a lot of people around and my, you know, my parents weren't present um, at times. And so there was a lot of time by myself and I felt so lonely and so sad and I couldn't stand quiet. Like being in nature and being quiet was just antithetical to peace for me. So I moved to the city and spent 32 years living in the grind in Hollywood. LA, just, man. Oof. Just, wow. Talk about noisy. And thrived on constant noise and stimuli and action and all the things, right? And I, I get your desire to be out just sitting on a rock. There's yeah. that nature bequeaths its own silence to those who immerse themselves in it. Yeah. There's like that certain degree of very pervasive, deep chill that oh, just comes from being outside where it's you're It's just like, weird though, because uh. yeah, it just takes adjustment because now, you know, we live as you know, like maybe 25, 30 minutes from downtown Austin. And I wouldn't say we're in the country, but you know, kind of deep suburbs, right? And I go into town and I'm just like, get me out of here. I can't stand it. Like a- it's Har actually hard for me sometimes. Like a Harley goes by, Bleh! and I'm just like, get me out. I'd like have a panic attack. I'm like, get me out of here. Have you ever noticed that like Sunday is usually the day when the vibe is the best? Yes. And it's yes. because consciousness is pervasive and connected, right? It's like a bed sheet that maps across the entire planet and all of the people are on it. And in our particular region of, of the world, Sunday people generally are chill. They're more chill. And yeah. that's why the vibe is like, <gasps> it's like a big sigh of relief because people lack, they're, they're more parasympathetic. They lack that crunchy kind of, you know, tenuous connection to the society as a whole that they normally have. And so it's like, I love Sundays because it's like a pause button on the insanity that usually comes across in waves through people's consciousness. Cause you can do what you want, but you're all still connected to it. Right? Like you still get rippled by it. It's like, it literally like a big ocean of awareness that kind of washes. And so Sunday is great for me because I'm like, ah, oh, it's chill. It's like the mountains. That's yeah. actually why I like the mountains yeah. is because the mountains have their own kind of buffering field, mountains and the ocean, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and they just, they sort of take the edge off of tense consciousness, which makes it really nice. That's interesting about Sundays because I still find Mondays so jarring and that's probably part of the reason yeah. why. Most people do. It's just, it's a function of consciousness. Dude. It's because you're connected to that. I'm like, why is, I, and I've thought about it, like, it's just... From one perspective, you could say it's just a mental construct. The whole calendar is fake. I mean, it's all just a man-made illusory yeah, kind but of it's, thing. It's a construct everybody's playing Everyone's into. Everyone's playing into it. So there is a field on Sundays, as you as you described, and there's going to be a different field yeah. on Mondays because everyone's kind of like, oh, I got to catch up. And everyone's feeling that collective stress. Consciousness is a lot like a bed sheet, right? Like you take one spot on it and you pull it up. Everything that's in proximity moves up with that thing, right? So as your awareness comes up, all the things close to you will move up and the things at the very edges of the sheet will move very, very little, you know? And when people are super stressed out, the more proximate you are to whatever that point of stress is, you know, like if you want to ever have the least chill day you can have, just go sit next to an ER. Like you don't have to do anything, but I promise you, if you go park your car in a park versus parking your car next to an ER, you can, put a blindfold on and put noise canceling earphones on, you will feel the difference. True. Yeah. True. I want to cover one more thing on this tangent, uh, about which I had no idea we would be going yeah, into no, today. Yeah, <laughs> like, nor, nor I. <laughs> I have I have not once looked at my notes. I'm sorry, Jared, you prepared such a beautiful manuscript today and I have literally not looked at it, I think, except just to know what the show notes are. LukeStory.com slash I N I N A number two. Um, and we'll put everything we can in, in those show notes. <laughs> it's so funny. This totally went in a completely different yeah, direction than either of us thought. 100%. But that's the best. It is, and actually. I'm assuming the best for people listening and watching too. But I, I do want to cover one more thing and just tease it out because I'm interested in your perspective. So we've talked a lot about um, reincarnation, right? And this mm -hmm. idea that we're a soul that kind of keeps manifesting into these different lifetimes and earning karmic merit and burning karmic debt, etc. But if you look at the idea that we were talking about um, that 
time as we know it is not a reality, right? That there's Mm -hmm. just an eternal now with no beginning and no end. That begs the question then, when we think about reincarnation as a past life, if there is no past, but we know that we've been here before a mm-hmm. number of times. Many of us have had experiences. But you didn't want to share yours because you were some <laughs> kind of asshole in your, your past lives. But you know, many of us kind of have the understanding and the inner knowing that, wow, this isn't my first rodeo. But if there's no time, then there's really, that negates the idea of a past life, which would lead me to the awareness that there are maybe infinite simultaneous lives of me living as individuated um, points of consciousness that we call different people in different quotes times that is actually all happening simultaneously in the eternal now. So that perhaps there's an eternal self, right, of, of, of me that doesn't have a name or body or anything, that's just one aspect of God that's floating around wherever it's floating around, and then, it's living through all of these different avatars as all these different human beings and different bodies and different time and times and spaces. But in actuality, it's all just happening at the same time. I think, <laughs> what, do you, so, what do you so, think about that? Some of this stuff borders on the, the philosophical more than, the, at least for me, philosophy drives me insane because people nosh about the concepts a lot spirituality to me in essence is kind of nice because it's very practical right it's the best science you can test it over and over right you meditate you get a certain result you meditate your consciousness moves and it's testable and you can do it over and over time we and we keep saying time doesn't exist that's true but if you try not to eat from from here on for eternity because time isn't a construct, unfortunately, your physical form over there is going to starve and you will die. You know, your consciousness is localized at one particular frame. And I agree that in in theory, in the overall, you're exactly right, right? Like you have all these different points that is expressing simultaneity. It is happening all, all at once because if you have infinite power as a creator, right? You're not going to make things in a linear progression. That would be, what's that term? Dumb. You're going to have it in a in a coplanar, multifaceted things where things are separated just by fractions of a degree and are all occupying the same space and the same reality at the same moment, just separated ever so slightly, which is why with things like DMT, um, your, your DNA, right, has a certain frequency, right? You are resonating at a certain frequency. DMT intercalates into your DNA. What does that do? It changes the frequency. It expands the dial on the radio that you're able to pick up. So suddenly you're seeing things that are always there, but they're typically gated and separated from you by just a little sliver, right? That's why people on a DMT trip will very frequently see the same thing, right? Like, oh my God, did you see that? And they think they're having the same trip. They're not having the same trip. They're just being exposed to a different piece of the plane that they're not normally able to tune into, right? It's there all the time, but in an infinite universe, it's just portioned out slightly differently so that it's not overwhelming. You know, the old school idea of the image of an angel where it has a thousand eyes. Well, why would you need that? Probably because you're working on multi levels of a coplanar existence all at the same time in all sorts of realities that other creatures are not capable of perceiving for their own benefit, right? Like that's, that's just how that works. I agree. It is happening simultaneously, but the beauty is your consciousness is localized in this one point at this one time. And, you know, the the other thing that a lot of people on the note of past lives take for granted is they think that it's a it's a progression, right? Like you were born in the 1900s and, you know, you, you died at such and such a point and then you're born in the 1970s. Exactly. Right. Probably not the case. More likely than not. You were born, let's say in the 1970s, you live, you die in the 2000s, and then you might be born in the 1400s, right? It's it's what you need to learn is more prevalent then than it is in the future. It's not a linear progression, right? right? Your consciousness, the epicenter of your consciousness will locate where it needs to so you can pick up the lesson that you need to learn, not the other way around, right? Again, it's solving <laughs> solving the equation from the right side. The nonlinear 
is really the key to all of this, right? Because, you know, a lot of this can get into mental masturbation and, yeah. and as you said, philosophizing, right? It's right. like, why do you need to figure it out? Just live your life and do the right thing, right? But I don't know, if you're wired like me, you want to know how everything works. But yeah. the thing is that the the what I'm endeavoring to understand and grasp is nonlinear, and is beyond what the human mind alone could possibly comprehend. And there's there's the rub, right? It's like you kind of, you know, you can use some intuition and you can use the soul's wisdom and kind of the inner knowing, but it's still going through the filter of the brain, which can really only experience the world in a linear fashion where one plus yeah. one equals two and so on, right? But the soul's kind of in here behind the brain going, yeah, but... I want to look past that. Yeah, and, you know? and I, I have no doubt, none, I would bet my life on this, that at, at a certain point you will, 100%. Yeah. I would be willing to bet my life on that, that that is in the cards for your future. You know, you will have that awareness where you do get to see behind the curtain, and that's just, that's, you know, I mean, if you're, and I know you, and you are earnestly seeking it out, that's the beauty of, I think, all this stuff is, if you really want the answer, and you're willing to, in earnest, knock on the door, do the work, open the door, walk through it, look around and not, you know, shy away for fear, you get the answers. They may not be what you think, you know, and it might be super jarring, but you get the answers, you know, and I, and I agree. I mean, I'm wired the same way. I always wanted to like, you know, charge forward and, you know, move my consciousness and do all that sorts of stuff. And I, that was just how I was wired. I came into the gate wired like that. It wasn't from, I mean, you can, ask my parents from the time I was a very, very small child, I was not tracking things normally. I mean, I remember going to bed, trying to delocalize my consciousness so I could experience the remainder of my body from my toes, right? <laughs> no, literally. Yeah. I, I would try and... You're like five years old doing remote viewing. <laughs> well, I was, I was actually, I didn't like the concept of sleeping much. And I would try and experience my body through my awareness in different parts of my body right? Like, because it didn't seem, it didn't make sense to me that your consciousness only expressed from your head, which is where most people feel like it's localized. Well, why couldn't I see the rest of my body from my toe or from my finger? And so I would do that. And I, you know, it, it literally was decades later when I started meditating where I was like, oh, so that's why I did that. You know, <laughs> it's like right. a very, right. very strange sort of arcane approach to things, but there was actually a purpose to it because your consciousness isn't actually localized like that, right? It's diasporic. It's, you know, it's separated and you can, you normally, you just orient it from one perspective, but it's not like that, you know, and you can shift perspectives. That's why you can literally, like you can see from someone else's perspective. Like, it's that whole, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, if you literally are looking at yourself through your neighbor's eyes, really easy to do because you don't have the perspective of it's us and them. I mean, it, it literally goes back to that Ramana Maharshi thing. I mean, from his perspective and where his awareness was, that's how he viewed the world. Now, he came back to teach. So to a certain extent, he's going to shelve that and he's going to put together a persona and come back and, and use that persona to operate through and integrate and work with people, right? Because he still has to have a linguistic construct to be able to deal with people. He still has to have a physical form to be able to deal with people. So even once, you know, guys like that, once they hit that point, they make a decision. Am I going to stay and teach? Am I going to try and impact the culture? And if so, they reconstruct the persona that you would equate with them. And then they use that, right? But that's not really where they are. That's just a tool that they're using to do that. I, I like what you were saying about, um, you know, with a DMT experience, for example, that if you and I right now both took some DMT, which we could, I have some, <laughs> I have some in the cabinet, that would make a good podcast. Yeah, I'm game. Um, I can already tell you what's going to happen. But yeah, it, but, but, but to, to, to your point, which I think is so interesting, you have the kind of reductionist, mechanistic, scientific-minded people that annoy the shit out of me that would say, <laughs> that would say... You, they would say that um, that when you when you put DMT in your bloodstream and it hits your brain, that it is causing you to have these hallucinations that aren't there, other dimensions, beings, etc. Right? And I, I don't think that's true. I, what you said makes more sense to me that all of this uh, the multi dimensionality 
that exist is always present. It's just that our receiver uh, in our senses is just not attuned to it because it would be too overwhelming. So it's like if you put a curtain right here in front of us where these cameras and Jared are, everything behind that curtain still exists. It's just, it would be too much to hold if we're trying to focus on one another, yeah. right? And then you introduce DMT or psilocybin or whatever it is, and all of a sudden that curtain gets removed and you're seeing everything that's already there. And that's why you and I would both see the same thing on the other side of the yeah. room. Well, have you seen the, the experiments of the University College of London where they, they figured out how they could, instead of having the DMT trip just be really, really rapid, they actually protracted it via drip. I really want to do that. Yeah. And so what they found though, and this is, this is really great, is people would go into these places, right? These altered states and have a conversation with an entity there. And then another person later would go into that place and have a conversation with that same entity and exchange and receive the information that the first person had. So that's not a shared trip. That's you're talking to something that's yeah. there, yeah. you know, and, and again, I, I know that that's going to seem, you know, it's going to probably piss a lot of people off, but you know, it, it is what it is. I didn't build this place. You know, that's just how the reality Don't shoot of it, the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unfortunately, that's usually what happens to scientists, though. When you, when you actually, yeah. in earnest, pull the thread and say, like, hey, look, this is what we found. It doesn't play so well, right? You know, I mean, historically, there's a great degree of persecution for people who are, like, ringing the bell going, look at what I found. You know, nobody really wants to hear that. They just kind of want to keep pulling along, you know, ringing the bell the way they're doing it. And uh, God, it's so weird to me. I just can't imagine. I mean, I guess everyone's just created through, um, I don't know, nature and nurture, I suppose, to be one way or the other. I just, I can't imagine being like, oh, it's like that. I can't hear you. La, 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 la. la, la, la. la. I just, I'm like. Serenity now. Like, how, why would you ever <laughs> be like that? It's so fascinating to, uh to um, embrace the infinite nature of reality. It's so fun. I think it's, it truly is beautiful. Like, yeah. Just beautiful. Like this whole place is gorgeous. I mean, warts and all, right? It's like when you love someone, you don't just love one aspect of them. If you've ever really, and I know you have, if you've ever really deeply loved someone, you don't care about what is perceived as an imperfection. It's not an imperfection. It's a part it's of endearing. Yeah. yeah. There's things I think Allison's within earshot. <laughs> She's probably going to ask me, what were you talking about? <laughs> there, there are things sometimes that Allison uh, does that are like my never really, I don't think I've ever really been truly pissed at her. Maybe a couple of times I've been like pissed off and I'm like, I'm going to go in my room and not talk to her. I'm mad a couple of times for a few minutes, maybe. And then I'm like, you're being an idiot. You love her. But there's, you know, personality traits that, it, that anyone we love uh, might possess or exercise. And there's a couple of things that she does sometimes that I find mildly annoying. And they're only annoying for a few seconds and then they become endearing. And I go, oh, that's so uniquely her, that one thing she does. Yeah. It's like so beautiful because it's part of her essence, right? Yeah. And it's only, it's only my perception of it or my perspective of it that would ever think, oh, it should be another way. She yeah. should, <laughs> she should <laughs> act this other way. Well, if she did that other thing, she wouldn't be her anymore. Right. Right, it's like this, no. I, I that's what of, I was joking about with my dad. I mean, he's yeah. we literally jokingly call him the harbinger of doom because he's like constantly like, oh, we're all gonna die, and that's the good news. You know that it's yeah. it's a lot of stuff like that, but it's kind of a joke, and I wouldn't have it any other way because it's sort of a a beautiful counterpoint. But it's just who he is, and you know, you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the stick, right? Like you you take the people you love for exactly face value, who and what they are warts and all everything yeah and and that's yeah. when you really and that's i mean to me that's the beauty of being here is right like it's that love thing right you truly express the love you have for other people best thing ever yeah it is um <laughs> it's fun. there's so many directions i want to go i want to say one more thing and then i want to get into some of your research and your latest developments because i i don't know <laughs> i talk to you or see you a couple times a year once a year whatever it is and like every time like you have this freaking wild ass oxygen water and like your like your inventions are super next level so i i would be remiss if we didn't talk about some of that but one last thing i want to share uh that was such an important piece to 
uh, these different um, dimensions that are mm -hmm. that are always around us and always exist, but that we're not um, always able to tune into. A few nights ago, we had a friend over who had never um, worked with any psychedelics or plant medicines. And she was like, hey, do you guys have anything around? I'm curious. <laughs> do you have anything you know? around? And I'm, oh my God, knowing you, that's a hilarious statement. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, um, you know, I'm uh, by no stretch a facilitator or shaman or anything like that. And I don't uh, pretend to be, but but I, I did have um, a, a version of some DMT that, that is pretty easy to kind of ease yourself into without mm -hmm. the full send. Um, you can smoke it and it's, it's, it can be very mild and really do nothing unless you kind of, you know, push it past that threshold. So, so I was serving her some of that and um, with kid gloves, just very cautiously, just a tiny little bit. And she's kind of looking at me like, uh, nothing's happening. I'm like, okay, let's try a little more. Then we finally hit the threshold of perception and she was sitting right here and uh and it was dark and she just starts laughing her ass off and she starts looking down that hall and she's pointing to me and allison we're singing her songs you know our own little versions of Icaros, i guess you could say and she's like do you guys see that do you see them and i was like them who she goes them you they're all right there and she was seeing some kind of entities or angels in the hall to one type of person you'd be like this chick just lost her mind or it's like her brain is creating some hallucination to me and probably to allison too we were like oh that's awesome there's some um malevolent beings hanging out in our hallway that are probably always there or else they just decided to visit right now but we just can't see them because we're not using dmt right she's the only one that pulled down the curtain yeah. right now. And we helped her pull down the curtain for a few minutes and she had a beautiful, you know, introductory, very soft and gentle experience, but it was enough for her to see like, oh shit, the veil's down and there's some cats hanging out in the hallway. <laughs> I actually wish everybody got to have that kind of an experience. I think it would really, I mean, I didn't for the longest time until probably way too late um, because I was like, as you know, like an altar boy, basically like, totally clean, straight arrow, boy scout, never did a single drug uh, until the point at which they were probably kind of pointless for me, <laughs> but I just hadn't, hadn't ever partaken, but I wish everybody got to have those experiences because they're profound and it is a beautifully elegant way of opening that door up, right? Like if, if you're in the right environment, there's a lot of case or cases that can be made for people abusing it. But I think in general, like with the kind of plant medicine that you're doing, hugely beneficial. Psilocybin, I mean, I know from my daughter having issues with anxiety and me, you know, developing a, a formulation that was based around psilocybin because that's what she needed, right? Like she didn't need the other things that have far more pronounced side effects that really have some detriment to them. She needed this particular thing. I have no problem with that. I think it's beautiful, actually. And I wish more people had those experiences. In her case, it was a very small microdose, but it elicited the right biological response. But for your friend, yeah. I mean, she will never forget that experience, right? Like it was, I'm sure, probably one of the most profound things she's ever experienced. I would, I would say so. It was beautiful for me too, you know, just to, um, it feels good to be trusted. Yeah. By someone. Well, the, you know. the space that you've created here, it does have like an awesome vibe. It would not mm -hmm. at all shock me that a bunch of like really cool benevolent beings are just like, yeah, I'm just going to go <laughs> chill out here. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> so. I was, I was a little tempted to be honest. Cause I was like, maybe I should take a hit of that. And I, I took a tiny, tiny little bit, but not enough to really produce a state change. But I was kind of like, I want to see them. What, what are you seeing down the hallway? I'd love to see them right now. And I, you know, I chose not to in that particular moment because I was just holding space for her. But yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I love that world. You know, it's in, there are of course people that are doing it dangerously and I always yeah. give the disclaimer. It's not for everyone, yada, yada. And there, and it, it's true. I mean, it can go horribly wrong. I know that because when I was young, I used to do psychedelics all the time indiscriminately and put myself in a lot of dangerous situations and cause myself a fair amount of emotional harm from yeah. just being traumatized uh, <laughs> while under the influence of LSD and things like that. And it's, I would not advise that. But that said, I naively, this is like universal. Anytime I sit with the plant medicine or use psychedelics intentionally, every single time 
during the experience, I'm like, my mom needs to do this. My dad needs to do it. Everyone <laughs> needs to do it. The, the president needs, you know, we need to like infuse DMT into the White House tomorrow. You know, it's like I have this whole plan for how to transform the world. And then, you know, the next morning I wake up and go, you know what? It's none of my business if everyone has this experience, although I think it would be useful. It's a good tool. Most of those things are really good tools. Like in the right hands, I mean, you yeah. can... Things things have a lot of positive benefit potentially, but sometimes they go horribly off the rails. Yeah, you a know. tool is a great way to, to contextualize it. Yeah. I mean, look at a gun, right? If right. you're out, it's an actuating thing. You're at a stranded distance. out in the woods and you're starving to death. A gun is probably the most useful tool you could ever have. If you're psychotic and you hate humanity. Probably not a good idea to carry a gun. Yeah, know? a gun and a hammer are basically percussive actuating tools. One operates proximately and one operates at a distance. Same damn thing. They're both tools. I've been a fan of the inventor Royal Rife forever. Rife devices use sonic frequencies to target specific issues in the body, and they can be wildly effective for various conditions. Well, now someone's combined the healing power of frequencies with Tesla energy technology in a single device to create a truly immersive sound healing experience. I'm talking about Paul Harris, the genius inventor who developed the Therify device. He just rolled out his new technology called the Quantify that does just that. The Quantify is a unique alternative to Rife style machines that's both compact and super easy to operate. You can use the Quantify with targeted frequencies or any of your favorite music through the high fidelity amplifier, giving you total control over the user experience. Quantify users have widely reported deep relaxation, emotional release, increased energy, and enhanced clarity. So if you're like me and you're into exploring the cutting edge of healing, head over to TherifyUSA.com. And using the code LUKE will save you $333 on both the Therify and the Quantify, and will also get you free shipping on the Therify. And while you're there, use the code LUKE to save $333 on a Therify or Quantify device. That's T-H-E-R-A-P-H-I, TherifyUSA.com. And on their site, you'll also, of course, find the original Therify device. It's amazing for pain relief, boosting the immune system, and speeding up recovery from injury. Again, that's TherifyUSA.com, and the code LUKE will save you 333 bucks on the Quantify or Therify units, plus get you free shipping on a Therify. And heads up, if you're a practitioner, massage therapist, acupuncturist, or someone who owns a healing center, or biohacking center, or something of that nature... I highly recommend you explore this technology. It's a total game changer for you and your business. Said like a great scientist. All right. <laughs> uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of your, your latest inventions. So for those, for those listening that aren't aware of Ion and your work, you have a company called Wizard Sciences. And, and maybe actually even before that, um, I know that you used to do a lot of formulating. Yeah you know, as a scientist in your lab and creating supplements, different products mm -hmm. for other people. Um, and probably, you know, I don't think you're, well, I know you're not like a money motivated person because you would have had your own company long time ago instead of making other people rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it seems like there was a certain point you're like, wow, I make some pretty novel and very effective and very pure and safe products. Maybe I should just do my own thing. What What was the um, deciding factor or moment when you said, you know what, like I'm doing all this great stuff for other people. I want to do my own thing. Uh, actually, I got back after a, uh, after a business trip um, and had received a letter at my previous company that I had started, but I had brought on partners um, from the accountant who was the primary partner that I was the board uh, no longer wanted me in day-to-day -day operations because I was too focused on trying to push the products and develop new things. And, and uh, I think they were a bit myth that I wasn't copacetic with the idea of just trying to increase profits. I really wanted to keep pushing the bounds because there, I mean, what we were working on, there's a lot of work that needed to be done, right? Like there's a lot of science that was still yet to be developed and sussed out. And when your mindset is like, oh, it's a company, we just want to make money. Okay, great. So you, what do you do? You, you, you stop development and you just try and figure out how to make it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so you can maximize your margins. I get that. That was not my jam. Um, and I think I had kind of frustrated those guys because I 
I am not really the guy who's going to stop tinkering and trying to improve things. And yeah, my motivation was not the bottom line. My motivation was how much benefit can I actually provide, right? Like, and one of the other things was at the time I was working with a group that was developing products with mushrooms and my, my group had come to me and said, okay, we're going to try and develop something with mushrooms. And I said, sorry, I can't do it. You know, like with deference to the other guys that I'm helping out, I can't take what I have, you know, worked on for them and then use it here. That's just ethically, that's not going to happen, right? Like at, th at the end of the day, it, it's hard to shave if you can't look yourself in the mirror to quote my grandfather, right? Like, so oh, I like that. Th that's just like, that's a line I'm not going to cross. Even though neither of us shave. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I get the metaphor. Right. Uh, yeah. So that was just a line that I wasn't willing to cross. And I think it very much upset them that like, oh, you know, you're off doing these other things and you want to keep spending money and developing stuff. And it, it just, it wasn't a good fit any longer. And there was such pushback from that that I was like, okay, you don't want me in day-to-day -day operations. I'm not, I'm not a guy who's just like a bean counter. I'm not going to just, you know, try and schlep stuff. That's, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not one, I'm not a Coke addict and I don't wear a blue jumpsuit. So I'm not going to go on sham. Wow. You know, that wasn't my gig. I, you know, I wanted to develop the science and really push it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go start my own gig and, you know, just develop like the best stuff I can. And so that's what I did. And I started it like two and a half years ago. Um, and going on three years now and have done some really good stuff, right? Like I, I hit a couple of good strokes. I mean, there've been some really great products, some of which I'm very proud of a lot of them. Unfortunately, I can't even really like share terribly publicly. A lot of people know what some of them are, but um, you know, just for fear of reprisal because you never want to treat or cure any sort of disease or condition. Those damn claims. Yeah. Those damn claims. Um, I find that to be so frustrating. Uh, and also in just my conversations with people like you that are well-meaning, brilliant inventors, formulators, et cetera, is that like, I know on the down low, I mean, you and I have talked yeah. about I mean, I've called you on numerous occasions. I think I talked to you once about Alzheimer's and you were telling me about this particular, the, yeah. what is this, the neural? Neural RX. Neural RX, and you told me some anecdotal. Yeah, um, and, and there are some testimonials from people where it's, bye, Yeah, it and then like the champ. big C, I've called you a couple of times when yeah. friends of mine have had the big C and you're like, do this, do that, take this, some of your products and some other yeah. um, recommendations. And it's like, and then those are, you get positive results and it's just, it sucks. You have a gag order that you can't talk about it. You know, yeah, it I does. mean, I not understand. It does actually suck. I mean, I get it because there are a lot of people out there who wouldn't be doing it, you know, kind of in an ethical way. So those, yeah. those systems are in place for a reason. Yeah. They don't always apply, but they are in place for a reason. And I get that. It's like building code enforcement, you know, like you have building inspectors. A lot of times they're really good guys with the right intent. A lot of times they're little demagogues who just want to express what small degree of power they have. Uh, in the in the considerations kind of like when I look at pharma uh, and like the FDA, the unfortunate part is that's just basically bought and paid for. It's a, it's a gatekeeper that's set up as a barrier to entry. You know, like if you don't have billions of dollars, you simply can't play that game. And from, from their standpoint, you have to respect it because it's really brilliant, right? Like you find guys who are, you know, the biochemists of the world or whatever particular field of endeavor they're in. You say like, oh, that's a great idea. We're going to buy it from you because we can actually do something with it. Whereas you can't, you know, like, <laughs> well, the fee, you know, like if you right. file, you know, for the, uh, you know, the IND one for the investigation of a new drug, the filing fee is like half a million bucks, right? Like, am I going to strip a check for half a million bucks? And then knowing that I'm going to have to spend on average $1.125 billion to get that done. Unfortunately, I don't have that, you know, to play with right yeah. now. And that, and that's, but that is actually like, that's what's requisite to play in that arena. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a gatekeeping function. So what I try and do is, you know, I will do smaller scale stuff and help people where I can and elicit change where I can. And that's it. And, you know, some people it's, it's grown, right? It's propagated. That wave is I'm focusing on what I can change and it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, you know, over time, I expect that it will actually be impactful enough that it will change a lot of people's lives, but it's, it's, 
it's pushing the swing at the exact right moment, right? You build that resonance just by repetitive successes over and over and over and helping people over and over and over. And then, you know, your network becomes strong enough and large enough that you can actually make a difference. Because even if people are like, oh, well, you know, I, I haven't seen the double blind placebo control trial of that. Right. But you know, somebody it's actually worked for. Do you, do you need to see a hundred million dollar study that says that, or can you just talk to someone, you know, who says, yeah, fixed me, you know, or fixed my mom or something like that. I mean, in the case of, because we're in Austin, one of the testimonials I have is from a doctor here in Austin who used that stuff with her mom, who was just wiped from Alzheimer's and, um, this stuff, the neural, yeah, neural RX, RX, which I'm almost out of, by the way, hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, happy to, I take happy a couple of swigs of this every day. I just drink it right out of the bottle. You, you know, the, the funny part about that is when I, I have some right now, cause I'm kind of tired from two interviews. Yeah. When I, uh, when I made that, it was interesting because what I realized is Alzheimer's isn't a disease. It's a protective mechanism. And everyone is subjected to the stuff on a daily basis that is actually triggering that. And so we need to pump the brakes on all those different components. So, I mean, that's, th there are other ways you can do it. That's a handy way to do it because it, it affects change on all of the different components that I could isolate. And, you know, not to say that it's a, it's a perfect setup, but it does work. And I've seen it work multiple times. Um, so I, I wish everybody were taking that kind of stuff. And if not from me, just from whomever, something similar. So you can clean the plaques out of your brain because we're all besieged by, you know, glyphosate and heavy metals and, you know, phyto compounds that are, that are the detrimental kind. They're like, you know, like uh, all of the different uh, compounds that are mimicking, you know, hormone mimetics and things like that. There's, yeah. there's so many things that we are hammered with on a daily basis it's nuts, even just dude. emfs right <laughs> yeah, like it's nuts you know that that affects voltage gated calcium channels in your brain which changes the efflux of debris and detritus do you, do, yeah in your brain. do you think that the um calcium what is it calcium gated voltage voltage gated voltage calcium gated channels can't so so uh, explain what that is because so, I'm about to do it poorly, but it when when I think about like heart disease and Alzheimer's, um, neurodegenerative stuff, where you have this buildup of plaque, it seems there is an obvious correlation between too much calcium in the system because I, it's not getting shuttled where it's supposed to go; it's getting into your cells. Is that you know as related not, to EMF? Is that no, true at all? Not not so much. Not with those okay. particular diseases. Not like with cardiac stuff. Uh, even even really not so much with the mental stuff. It is it is problematic, but it's problematic more because of uh, not cycling waste properly. Uh, okay. Cell phones are actually probably the biggest culprit, literally, because you know you have it in such close proximity to your head, and the frequencies coming off my I iPhone. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I mean, people laugh because I'm I still on, wear. I'm on you know. speakerphone with my <laughs> Defender Shield case holding my phone out here. You know, <laughs> hello. You've got yeah. your megaphone. Hello. Yeah. Inverse square law, man. <laughs> Distance. That's yeah. Know? That's actually that's like the best thing for you. That's the best protection. You know, because when your phone you know tries to transmit the signal boost, right? So you're getting more EMF exposure, and I mean your Defender Shield thing, great idea you know, rock that. But the, the, the gated calcium channel flow doesn't really affect that so much. It's the big, the big culprits are physical stressors. Sometimes it's emotional stressors, but the big culprits I think are you know, things like P. gingivalis in your mouth because it's so close to your brain, right? And what does your brain do when it has something that's impacting it? It just wraps it in a little protein packet oh, you know tau proteins. Is that beta like plaques. a bacterial infection in your gums or something? Exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so, but, oh, but it's, and I bet like cavitations probably would yeah, be part of that. There's so too. many issues that that you don't think of, and it's the reason it's humans really do. We kind of suck at multivariate systems analysis, right? Like when when one thing that we call a problem, like say Alzheimer's, has a host of reasons that can actually be causal. We're like, oh well, we checked it for this. It's not that well maybe not in that person, but maybe in this person, right? And so if you have one condition that can be triggered, it's like Hashimoto's, right? Hashimoto's is very commonly known to be triggered by emotional stress, by physical stress, you know, and 
it doesn't matter, or even by physical trauma, right? You can get in a car wreck and it can trigger Hashimoto's because it doesn't matter what the origin of the stress was, it's still a stress. And it's the Chairman Mao thing of, you know, fear, it doesn't matter if it's incited, you know, or uh, real or elicited or imaginary. I mean, it's just, uh, it's the same net result. It's, you know, it's still fear. And this, whatever the biological insult is, whether it's a chemical or a metal or a, a bacteria or a virus, whatever, it's still an insult. And so I just wish people were taking things like that just so that they could combat the daily aggregation of all that stuff. Because what happens is you don't really see it building up over time until it becomes an issue, right? It's like you're setting aside garbage and things that could be damaging, and then it's not a problem, not a problem, not a problem, not a problem. But at a certain point, it becomes problematic in the scales tip. And as you get older, your your brain's lymphatic system, which washes away, you know, uses interstitial fluid and cerebrospinal fluid to, to wash, it's literally a hydrostatic pressure system, right? And so the older you get, your mitochondria have less force, hence the pump has less force. So you're not cleaning yourself as fully. So you have more of a buildup and you have less capacity to clean it. So it's it's a negative feedback loop that builds on itself and it just becomes more and more and more of a problem. But the 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 beauty is there are easy ways to deal with that. I mean, this is this is just one. There's lots. Um I just I mean, that's kind of indicative of some of the stuff I do though, because that had a specific purpose, right? Like find a find a specific disease that somebody was having a problem with. They, you know, asked me to do something, and so I did. Um, the other things up here, that one, the Mitocure, that is arguably my favorite supplement. And it's like methylene blue, urolithin A, PQQ, and then a nitric oxide blend, which is just arginine and citrulline. And the rationale for that is I had been taking urolithin because it, it purges mitochondria and it triggers mitophagy. And there's a, a company that had, you know, been making a lot of urolithin A products, which I took. And I met with one of the guys and said, look, you should do it like this. This is a better version because you're not just trying to trigger mitophagy and replace the mitochondria. What you really want to do is you want to create a clean signal from the noise, which is why there's methylene blue in it. So you can actually see what you're doing. And then you want to increase mitochondrial biogenesis, right? Get a higher density and more of them. And so that's PQQ, pyroloquinoline quinone, right? That triggers that upreg. And so- Is that why PQQ gives you energy? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it, and it's actually, it's interesting because per volume, a couple of milligrams of PQQ per kilogram of food actually elicits a very large biological response. So you need very, very small amounts of it. And there's actually, there's, you know, probably, I think ballpark about 10 or 10 or 11 um, milligrams per dose in that, maybe, maybe a hair more. And then there's about a little more than five milligrams of methylene blue. But again, those are just kind of after effects, right? So you, you increase the signal so you can see the signal from the noise. Then you go in and you purge the mitochondria. Then you make more of them. And for me, it's it's just, it's a math thing, right? Like the, the one thing I will say is the, the nitric oxide boost, methylene blue causes kind of a transient dip in nitric oxide synthase. And most people who are at the age where they're worried about, you know, swapping out their mitochondria don't really want that dip in nitric oxide, right? So I just put all the, the precursors in so that it can activate the substrate. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, well, it just counters it. So you activate it yeah. before you get the little dip. You're a smart fucker, man. <laughs> like the, way, <laughs> the way you formulate stuff is interesting because I'll see some of your stuff. It's it, like this this new one that's your favorite, which says a lot. Um, Mitocure RX yeah. is the one you're speaking of. So these, yeah. are, these are capsules and this. Uh, in this kind of um, what's this color blue cobalt um, cobalt yes yeah. yes love that color um, it's funny because I looked at the ingredients when you sent me a bottle and I was like yeah you know I, I already take your a methylene blue pqq so I was like and even these amino acids you know the nitric oxide I was like I don't know, I already take that stuff what's the point but then I'll talk to you and you explain like oh each one needs the other one because it's a whole synergistic yeah relationship it's, yeah right? there's there's one i'm about to come out with that is nmn uh a pigeonin or apigenin depending on who you speak with uh and then um not resveratrol but ginsenicides right and historically uh. most people take nmn and resveratrol and if you look at the studies ginsenicides are so much more effective right so like does gen, that come from ginseng, ginseng. Oh, okay. yeah 
And I'll, I'll send you the graphs of it. You can post it in the show notes, but it's like massive difference, right? Like you get a little bit in your skeletal muscle, you get a little bit in your brain, a little bit in your heart. You get more like for, for NAD precursors, right? So you can get a certain amount of NMN to go in, but if you couple it with resveratrol, you get a little more. But if you couple it with ginseng derivatives, you get this huge amount. And then if you put the, you know, the uh, apigenin in, it blocks the CD38 so you don't get the breakdown. And so your body has longer to actually process it. So you get this massive uptick and it, it is, That's it's, cool. well, it, it's looking at things and not just hitting it at face value. It's like thinking through the puzzle, right? First, you have to identify what is the puzzle. And then once you really understand what it is like this, I wanted more mitochondrial density. Well, why? You got 4 trillion of them. If you replace them in a one-to-one -one basis, you've got four trillion of them that maybe go from operating at 70% capacity to 90% capacity. But if you replace them at a one to 1.3 ratio, you end up with 5.2 trillion, right? So even if you don't increase the wow. capacity, you still are running at like close to 100% of what you were before. And then if you do like something, one of the serums like the Olympic serum or Evolve, something that's just like a carbon 60 based formula, well, those things right out of the gate trigger a massive uptick in, in mitochondrial function and ATP production. So if you stack those things, then you end up running at, you know, for ballpark numbers, like 140% of what your previous capacity was after a couple of months. And I, I got a lot of stuff that I really want to do. And so I have to make sure that I have the energy to do it. And I, I mean, admittedly, I kind of run my body into the ground, but I... I got a lot of things that I want to accomplish. And if this is the vessel that I'm going to use to do it, I have to have a certain degree of mental acuity to pull it off. And so I've got to process through that. And these are the, they're the tools of the trade. I mean, that's, that's just, that's what I'm going to do. And if it existed out there, like I was taking your lithin A, that was good. This was better. Those guys didn't want to do it. So, you know, scratch your own itch, right? Like define the things that you need and then build the tools that you need to get the job done. If you're listening and you want to cut down on the microbes, fungus, and mold in your body, but you don't want to mess with the uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, it might be time to try a natural solution that's been used for centuries, colloidal silver. Not only that, but the patented silver sol technology from Silver Biotics doesn't harm the beneficial bacteria while doing its job in the body. Unfortunately, other brands can harm probiotics with as little as three parts per million. And Silver Biotics has tons of ways for you to get the benefits of colloidal silver that are safe, non-toxic, and have no known side effects. They've got creams for healthy skin and even a new anti-aging facial serum, plus silver-infused drops, sprays, and lozenges to boost your immune system, and oral care products like whitening toothpaste and gel, of which I am a huge fan. In fact, I always pack the lozenges and the spray in my bag when I'm doing some air travel. And one of my favorites is their first aid armor gel to take care of cuts and burns. It's even good on sunburns and bug bites, which I found to be very useful here in Texas. So head over to silverbiotics.com to check out their whole range of products and use the code LUKE to save a massive 30% off your entire order. And heads up, if you've got pets, make sure to check out that product too. I give it to our dog Cookie on the reg and it's pretty damn amazing. Again, visit silverbiotics.com and use the code Luke at checkout. So it must be so fun. I, I wish I had the scientific, I, my brain just doesn't work like that. I may have other gifts, but it, imagining myself with your lab and your intellect, I would be like, as you always do, like, ha ha, <laughs> uh, mustache twist. You know, I'm like, oh my God, I could make some cool yeah. shit, you know, because I have the ideas for yeah. things, but it's like, I would have no idea how to formulate something and understanding the chemistry and biochemistry and all of that. It's actually, I love that. I mean, it, it just, it's it super, comes. I mean, at least I get to know you and like, <laughs> you send me the shit you come up with and I get to take it. Um, well, some of it's, it's like, this one is the dermal serum and I just released that and that's for psoriasis and eczema primarily and it works like a champ i mean if you look at like the testimonials that people have sent in it's awesome it's great what's stuff. in that one so it's it's a basic it's a small chain fat uh, caprylic acid right so it's a medium chain triglyceride but it's relatively in terms of size kind of a tiny chain length c8 and then it's bound to c60 and then it's got a, a form of coq10 in it and 
it's the same. I'm preaching to the choir. It's the same kind of thing where you provide the body the tools that it needs to do what it needs to do, right? So psoriasis and eczema, they get a massive boost because suddenly the mitochondria in those regions are amping up at the same time you're dropping cytokines, right? So you squelch oh, okay. the cytokines. And so, it's topical. And it's topical, oh, okay. yeah. So inflammatory response dips out at the same time you trigger an upregulation and energy production. Ah. And so the body just fixes itself. I mean, if you really, in my opinion, if you really are good at, kind of biochemical stuff, you realize like, I'm not gonna figure out a system that's better than nature. So I'm just going to try and give it what it needs so it can do its job. And that's it. And then just totally. get out of the way. Like totally. this one, the the hair growth stuff, which is coming out very shortly. Um, we, we actually have a separate site called Repair Hair Loss. And uh, that comes out, but that's same thing. It's a, it's a non-comedogenic, so it's not an oily thing, but it's a, it's an, a lipid that's bound to a C60, but it has peptides and stabilized exosomes. And, you know, it's got a whole host of things. I'm so stoked for that. Yeah, that stuff is... I'm a good case study because my, my, yeah, my hairline, just... every year I watch my hairline go back by about a quarter inch. I'm just like, oh man. Yeah, it's great, but it's got all the components of things I want. Would you use a derma roller? To... Yeah, 100%. Yeah, okay. I would use a derma roller and a red light. Like, it's, I've got a it's, whole... not, it's not greasy? No. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, it's actually here. Try it. It's actually it's exceedingly cool because you put it on and it feels oily. And I just put it on away. and I get like chia pet hairs just start <laughs> popping up right now. Luke's story: the man with the afro. Well, <laughs> right. You, 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 you a couple years ago, you sent me, um, you sent me a hair serum. I think one of your yeah. prototypes, and um, that was know, like iteration two. This is iteration. Yeah, I mean, five. I would say it was. I wouldn't say it was like greasy, but greasy enough where if i like put it on at night my pillowcase is trashed yeah you know i put on during the day i'm kind of all shiny and and greasy looking so yeah. i've been kind of waiting like oh well, this it, would be cool if i could do it and just live my life and not have to kind of like relegate time where i don't mind looking like a grease monkey yeah it's it took a little bit actually trying to figure out like nice packaging too oh thank you nice feel yeah I like the little rubberized label. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, it it, it all of these things they take a while. That's why it's kind of an iterative thing. Is because I'll go, huh? You know what would have worked better, right? Like, I mean, again, it's that reinventing the oval. You know, I mean, I I too fall prey to the same normal human thing of like, oh, this is a great idea. It's the best thing ever. And then you know, you go in a couple months and you're like, you know, yeah, it's like NMN and ginsenicides, right? Like, I have resveratrol and a bunch of stuff. And for those, I will probably keep it for specific reasons. But just in terms of a supplement, ginsenicides are better, you know? And why would I continue to do what everybody else is doing when I have seen the data and it's clear? It's not even marginal. It's absolutely crystal clear. Like, this is better. Well, I think that. that's an interesting element into uh, what goes into the development of your wizard sciences stuff is you can't make medical claims even though you have valid anecdotal yeah. reports and testimonials right but because of those regulations which as you said they serve they serve a purpose um but what you can do is if you have a brain like yours you can mull over the research and make those distinctions between these different molecules and what happens when you stack them right yeah so you can say resveratrol does x y and z because there's clinical data to support that yeah and it's up to the consumer to kind of put two and two together and know like, all right, if we're talking about the big C or yeah. dementia well, or hair loss or whatever <laughs> it is, eczema, like you can't come out and say, this cures eczema. But you can say, in this study, this particular substance was shown to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. It, is that kind of how it works? That is kind of how it works. Like, may help with the symptoms associated with <laughs> right, the thought right. about the problem that seems yeah right. i mean it's all kind of bs obfuscation language but yeah, yeah. That's, that if that's the game you have to play there's no sense in getting you know grumbly about it that's that's yeah. the game okay fine yeah you know we'll do it and i'm sure you're still you're still doing well right i mean your company's yeah it's growing stable and growing yeah. and everything's cool yeah. um by the way uh, said company you guys you can find at wizardsciences.com we'll also put that in the show notes with everything we talked about uh, as i mentioned earlier and looks like we've got a 15 percent discount using the code luke so wizardsciences.com code luke yeah like everything else um i ever talk about with guests 
I just don't talk about shit or give people links and codes unless I literally use the products all the time. Yeah, I know you've been using that for years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I go through it. There was a point in the beginning when you guys launched, you were super generous. And I was like, shit, you guys sent me like five bottles of this. And then as you've grown, you probably work with more influencers. So I don't get the lion's share. Dude, seriously, the, just hit me up. But uh, I, yeah, I'll kind of like pace myself. And then I, eventually I end up hitting up don't. Todd. Like, hey, would you guys mind sending me a bottle of the thing? You know, I will I will unequivocally say, just hit me up. Okay, don't good. don't even I'll hesitate. Do just text me. Like, I'm kind of, I, I never want to be like entitled, you know. Um, it, it, trust but, me, you you really there are certain people who are in the world. You are not one of them. So good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear yeah, that. And, and I would I would not pull any punches. Yeah, hit okay. me up anytime, man. I cool. really I applaud how you roll and what you're doing, and anything I can do to support it, I'm going to do. I appreciate that. Well, my brain and and like you said, I mean, I'm uh, aging. I'm 53. I'm going to be 54 this year. And I mean, I would say, aside from this tinnitus issue, um, and kind of my eyes aren't great after like seven hours of podcasting, like you're a little blurry now <laughs> and you were clearer before, yeah. you know, there's just things like that. But with the goals I have in the world and how I want to contribute my gifts and my energy, uh, my brain needs to work really well. I need to be sharp or it's just not fun to do what I do. So I think that's why a lot of your products have to do with energy and, and mental acuity and sharpness and memory yeah. and creativity and all of those things there, even though you don't like market as nootropics, I think a few of your things are very powerful nootropics because of yeah, the, they are because you're targeting the mitochondria, I think is what it is. Right. And it's like, when you have that kind of metabolic energy, everything just works better. I, do you know, Drew Pearson? Uh, you introduced me to him. Okay. Yeah. So, about neurofeedback. Yeah. yeah. So I was Drew gonna, is, I was contemplating going to see him in, in San Diego yeah, to see Drew if he could fix my ears. Yeah, he is great in terms of like QEEG work. And when I was at his facility in uh, San Diego, we had uh, a QEEG hooked up, and I was tracking my evoke neural potentials. Right, it more than doubles when you take that stuff. When the serum kicks, it just goes through the roof. Like you literally wow. have so much neural potential that it pales by comparison. I mean, it literally is more than doubles. Like it's just ridiculous how well it works. And it kicks in too, because we had it kind of at threshold. I had capped out as much as I could do. And I took the serum while still on the QEEG. Everything was fine. Everything was fine. Everything was fine. Not going up, not going down. And then the serum kicked in and it just started going up. No shit. Up. And yeah, it was, oh, it was actually, cool. it was so kick-ass to see it like empirically yeah, I love where you're that. actually yeah. on it. And you're like, wow. Yeah. It was great to actually have like formal data looking at it and going, damn, that's okay. I could feel it, but yeah, it's kind of funny. Like you can feel it. So you have the anecdotal data, but when you actually see it and you're like, well, you know, it's really cool to actually get a solid data set and go, yeah, told you. I agree. I love to quantify, um, you know, I wish neurofeedback was like more kind of home friendly, but I do have a neurofeedback device called the Mendy. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, this thing. Yeah, actually, you told me about it and I bought one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Super cool. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not as advanced, right, as something like Drew's doing uh, by any means, but it, it is effective and there's definitely data to support that it is helpful. But I love that particular device because I'll try different things and I'll see kind of how sleepy my brain is, right? Like how much neural activity I can actually yeah. produce. Um, based on blood flow is how this particular one works. And um, so I've done different experiments with it where I take different supplements or I take a microdose of a plant medicine or something. But what makes the freaking brain activity off the charts is the biocharger. Oh, yeah. I'll sit in front of that thing with the Mendy on and my score just goes like <laughs> through the roof, like red line, you know? It's, well, like, it's, it's so interesting. So I think, because people ask me, what does the biocharger do? And I'm like, ah, I'm not that good at explaining it. I just know, like, if you sit in front of it, depending on the frequency you choose, uh, it can give you a lot of energy or it can help you really calm down and kind of meditate and so on. But I'll put it on one of the high energy ones, like Turbo Boost or whatever. I think one's called Nitro. That mm -hmm. one like knocks you on your ass. And I put that thing on, sit there with the Mendy on, I watch my score and it's just off the charts. It's well, so fun. you remember the, uh, the Lakovsky chair at my lab? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, like when you sit in a Lakovsky chair, same effect, because you have all of these frequencies rolling through you that your cells pick up that you, because you can basically the way we're built we can derive 
energy from, you know, physical compounds. We can derive energy from photonic things, just from light, literally from acoustics, just from mobile things, you know, like, because mitochondria are piezoelectric, right? So the acoustic waves actually will drive them and they'll release energy. Or you can just derive it, you know, through through the air, just from, you know, frequencies and scalar waves and just EMF. And so when you sit in those things, it's the exact same thing like a biocharger. It's this multivariate kind of field effect happening on all these different frequencies and your cells take what they need and they ditch the rest, right? It just goes out, but you, your energy literally goes up. I mean, you're, it's like wireless charging for a body. Right, right. I mean, it literally is. That's why I do the Lukowski right. chair is like, I'll go in and, you know, because I am, I know that I'm running myself kind of hard. So I'll go in and I'll crank the Lukowski chair up. Did you make that thing? No, no. Oh, okay. a, a friend of mine in Washington state made it. Yeah, oh, okay. And so, yeah, Aaron Murakami. And uh, I, it's just, it's a, it's a great rig. Like, yeah. you, you know, because it does, it literally charges you. It is a wireless charging system for biological systems. I, I knew that it, the biocharger in particular, I knew that it was doing something. It wasn't just a bunch of bells and whistles, but again, just seeing empirical evidence to support yeah. that. It's very cool. It makes it, it for me, it makes, it makes it easier to buy in and it also helps with my compliance. Right. Cause I could walk by that thing every day and I'm like, ah, I don't have 15 minutes to go sit in front of the biocharger. But then I remember, Oh shit. I remember what it does to my brain that I could see and prove. I, yeah. That. So then I start using it more, you know, or even, with like a supplement if i take oh, your yeah. neural rx and i'm like holy shit i just sat at my computer and crushed work for five hours and didn't even yeah. blink well one of the things it encourages me to keep doing it you know you, you probably haven't well i don't think actually i don't think i've told anybody this yet um so one of the things that i'm going to release in about a month probably by the time this podcast airs it should be out already uh is a line of quantum charge supplements so and oh I'm, no shit yeah yeah so i'm using the the lila tech because i do quantum charging a couple of different ways because i figured out a few ways to do it but and this it's going to be the lila stuff because i've got i've done the data and we've shown like the difference in the compounds like vitamin C, zinc, D3, K2, magnesium, stuff like that, you can actually quantitatively and qualitatively show, wow, that's a huge difference just in like reduction oxidation potential, like across a bunch of different metrics. Oh, wow. It's the same compound from the same vial. One is charged, one is not. And it looks like an entirely different compound because the efficacy is so much higher. Are you in that case able to measure the orp like before and after yeah actually you can wow yeah that's cool yeah again like that's another one of those well that's a thing ways is, to quantify something like I, that's right. why i love water right there's all kinds of cool shit you can do with water and there are ways you can test it right you can you know you can look at the tds the orp yeah. the ph and so on yeah gerald pollock's work man i'm a, i'm a huge fan of because he, yeah Homeboy really drilled down on the waterfront. I mean, it's yeah. very impressive to me, actually. Just, oh, it's you know. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. That guy should be sitting on like a Nobel Prize, 100%. It's shocking that he's not more wide. I mean, he's, you know, he's widely recognized within certain confines, but not worldwide. It's actually when I taught biochemistry, it was mostly to seniors at a university who were going off to like med school. Half of them and the other half were just biochem majors for, it was a required course for them. But I had two books that were required reading. One was a book called Life on the Edge, which is about quantum biology. Because I thought rather than teach these guys, you know, what everybody's been doing, I'm going to teach them where it's going to be when they're actually out in the world. And then the other was the fourth phase of water, Gerald Pollock's book. Because to me, it made you look at something that you're always around that you just take for granted. Like, it's water. Of course I understand yeah. water. Yeah. And when you really get it's into it, you're like, liquid. shit, I obviously do not really understand water. Like there's so much more to it. And when you start looking at yeah. it, like what an exclusion zone can do and how does it do it? And what, how does signaling work in the body? And it's more of an ionic function than a, you know, the, and a pumping function. Like there are so many things that when I went through that personally for the first time, I was like, oh my God, wow, bad on me for just assuming that I knew it because I had been around it the entire time. I had no clue. You know, and that, so that's why it was required reading for my course was just, I wanted people to understand that. And I, I'm a like huge fan and he should be. Fascinating, yeah. fascinating work. He was on the show uh, some time ago. We'll put the link to uh, the Jerry Pollock interview in the show notes as well. Did you ever by chance hear the episode I did last year in 2023 with Veda Austin show about yes, water? Yes, I did. Dude. Yeah, she, man, the, like the images she was taking. Mind-blowing. Yeah. 
that was which i'm so grateful for you know for her because she's such a beautiful person and such a brilliant scientist in her own right in her own unique way um is oh she was my top shared episode of 2023 really yeah and i had some big wow that's actually on. that's surprising isn't that cool yeah i, well, I like, mean i wow. guess it kind of captured i mean literally we're made up mostly of water <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah you know but that that is actually kind of surprising it was meaningful to me because i had people that are much more widely known mm -hmm. uh, on the show and and i always like having people on the show that aren't widely known or have never even been on a podcast before and they just have something really unique to offer and she'd been on a few podcasts but definitely isn't a household name by any stretch even in these circles oh, that's really interesting and I, yeah people shared the hell out of that and i yeah. was like man it was and i remember it being just in the moment just having my mind blown it was such a deep uh, well her conversation. stuff like luke montagnier the nobel laureate who worked yeah. with water holy yeah. shit you read montagnier's stuff truly mind-blowing like it that for me was like a, a complete paradigm shift when i read his stuff i was like okay again obviously yeah. i was missing it you know like turns out you know it, it's funny to me like there are these things that we take for granted that are right in front of us the whole time that we just assume we understand like water having memory well of, yeah of course it does it makes sense now because it's literally a stereoscopically stacked liquid crystalline structure yeah, so like any other LCD matrix, you can store data in it. Not right. It's not right. terribly surprising when you look at it from that perspective. But at first, you're like, it's water, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know? And yeah. you just like you don't think about it, and then you reframe it. You're like, oh wow. And then you look at Montagnier's work, and you're like, holy shit! Not only can you store it, but you can play it back. I mean, truly brilliant. Like actually, the thing as a scientist, the thing that impresses me about that is not so much what he did it's having the mindset to even come up with that with that line of inquiry just fucking brilliant right like because right, right. it was so aside from the fact had he not had a nobel prize already people would have just written him off as a complete quack and i think most of mainstream science did kind of write him off as you know being like that strange weird water guy who's a quack and also a nobel laureate you know but his his work like who comes up with an experiment like that <laughs> it's just brilliant i mean that's the cool thing about true scientists right is sometimes just the inquiry is really the brilliance regardless of what the outcome is just to, to yeah. have to yeah, have the truly. insight to even ask the question to begin with right to even what? to even open up the inquiry like hey i wonder what if and then you do the experiment and the result is almost like, yeah, okay, the result's fine. But how did you even think to look there? Yeah. It's not even what you found necessarily. It's like plant it's like, medicine sometimes when you hear the stories yeah. about how, how primal, your primitive cultures have arrived, primitive, I say in quotes, cultures have arrived at it. You're like, right. So what was the administration? Usually you hear the same thing that the plants told us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I love that. I you love know? that. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, I love that. Good. The plants told you. Yeah. But a lot of times you think like, so why were you licking this toad? Now, explain to right. me the thought process behind grabbing a toad and going, you know, I think I'm going to lick this toad. Like, yeah. you know, I know toad pops, crazy. who knows? It's crazy. Uh, before we go, while we're on the topic of water, so you you guys shipped me some of this water. Oh, today. yeah, yeah. Super oxygenated water. Yeah. And that caught my attention because I love water and I love oxygen. And... um. And so I was, of course, looking at the parts per million. Now, I have the Ophora water system here in the house, this thing called the BioQuantum mm -hmm. machine, I think it's called. It makes hot and cold water, and it's yeah. all filtered and beautiful and remineralized. It's good stuff, actually. Structured and all that. But I think it's like... 10. Yeah, okay. Like 10 parts per million, yeah. which maybe is what you get if you went up to a mountain spring or something, right? And drink it right out of the source. There's going to yeah, be... Yeah, if it's cold, yeah. Yeah, bubbles of oxygen in there. Right. So, it, and that water really tastes delicious in our kitchen. I mean, it tastes like really good spring water out of the mountain. It's just got a great energy to it. So I look at this and I'm like, okay, it says seven times more oxygen than regular water. All right, what does that even mean? And then I look, 50 parts per million. I mean, this is like drinking a little hyperbaric yeah, chamber or something. I'm it, like, what the well, hell? Yeah, it was It was actually just used at the uh, the NFL Combine. And it was very cool. The, the, actually, the kids that were doing the Combine sent me, a I'll show you the video. They sent me a video with the water and it was awesome. It's amazing to me actually what, 
they can do like with an iPhone now. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like a Nike commercial, but for the kids that were doing the combine. Um, but it, it's great because it's, I mean, we did this with you downstairs, right? You put a pulse oximeter on and you already had your, your saturation levels at 99%. So that wasn't going up, but your pulse went from 59 to 53, right? So whatever, whatever the cardiac loading is, it takes the stress off, right? Because basically your heart is just trying to move oxygen to your cells. So in this case, you were, your saturation was great. So it just took the load off of your cardiovascular system by virtue of dropping your pulse. And so for athletes, it's great because it's like, having an inline bottle, right? Like you are drinking, you know, air in a can. It's right. You see fantastic. like football players run over to the sidelines and put on the oxygen mask or even um, in concerts. Sometimes you'll see yeah. performers do that, right? They run behind an amp and they're like, yeah. Having done that oxygen. before, this is an order of magnitude better. It's so much better. Really? See, yeah. I, I got to test it. I, I, I don't exercise that hard as we were discussing earlier, but I do have the Carol bike down there and it, Carol AI, will, man. Hop yeah, on that thing 15 and do minutes, it. it will whip your ass to where you are panting for your dear life. So I want to get to that, that state and, and then, then chug one. one of these. Yeah. I'll be hammer able to one tell. I'll be able to feel 100%, it. 100%. Wow. 100%. Yeah. Hammer one back and wait about 50 ish seconds. Yeah. And when I did the same thing, the weirdest feeling, because <laughs> I had never done it before, I just made this stuff, was I, I was panting and I downed it and I was still panting. And then I was like, <sighs> And it just stopped, right? Like no, no labored breathing at all. And I was like, what the hell was that? Because I just never felt anything like that. But your body, it's a, it's efficient, right? It's like when it hits homeostasis again, and it doesn't need to exert the energy to breathe because you suddenly have the oxygen, it literally just stops. That's so cool. It, it's a very, because I had never felt anything like that. Like yeah. literally mid breath or like, <sighs> Okay. <laughs> yeah that's fun it's oh, great I gotta though try that. i mean i think this this launches uh this summer and so it'll be drinkinhale.com okay. cool so yeah will it be available on the wizard sciences site no it'll it'll, it'll be, be its own yeah, thing yeah it'll be its own thing okay well we'll put that in the show notes yeah. drinkinhale.com yeah, drink okay inhale. even though the show will come out before summer we'll put yeah. it in there for yeah it's good stuff retroactive there. listens will be you know if you guys hear this yeah after the summer it'll be there yeah i'm i am actually a big fan so that and the hydrogen water that we have at the lab that we drink and those are great, man. I mean, just slight modulations in like the different types of water that you consume because everything's of course structured and all the stuff that I personally think is, is yeah. impactful. Yeah. Um, but it just, you can change your biology so much, right? Like hydrogen water is awesome. It's got whole signaling cascades that drop out inflammatory response and you know, your energy levels go up. It's just, it's good stuff. And the oxygen for athletics, I always think of this more as like performance and the other is more recovery. That I mean, I can make, oh, okay. I can kind of make a case for this. Like if you drink this late at night, cause I've had a bunch of people tell me this, um, they sleep incredibly well if they, which makes sense, right? Because you, you know, your oxygen saturation goes up. So, you know, a lot of times people have apnea and things like that and they run into yeah, issues because yeah. they're literally in a state of oxygen deprivation. Um, but yeah, I always kind of think of this as more like performance. You know, what would be sick is if, somehow you could trick uh the uh, tsa that this is like a medically necessary <laughs> drink <laughs> so you could break because it's way more than four ounces yeah this is 12 ounces they are gonna fly through the uh the you know the pre-check line but man i'm thinking like oh god on the long flights this would be oh, so would be, epic uh, just yeah, bring your blood saturation back up to 99 in yeah. a few seconds that actually would be fantastic on those flights because yeah. you are completely being deprived yeah. when you're up there. I have smuggled the little hiker canisters have you really? on there. Yeah, I've never been stopped, but then I'm like, ah, I always think maybe this time they're going to get me and they're quite expensive, you know? So I'm just like, ah, do I really want to drop like 60 bucks on these canisters and have TSA take them away? But yeah, I, I have taken them on. I've never, they've never taken them away because I get the smaller ones, not like the big ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the oxygen bottle yeah that's the wheel behind the oxygen but then cart. it's um i don't know but i think also i was i'm not that easily embarrassed but it's kind of weird if you know you're sitting next to someone and you're like you know like i would dip down kind of because i didn't want the stewardess to see me and you know get pissed and like you yeah. can't have that and you'd have to have like the balloon where you're like yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i was just but i used to carry a pulse ox with me on the plane and try all kinds of different stuff and i also figured out actually to be fair um now that i think about it 
I would, I can't really do breath work because I don't want to freak people out or have them think I'm a, a terrorist or something. <laughs> but I would play around with like just doing deep breathing and I could bring my blood oxygen up in a few minutes of kind of mellow breath work. And I was like, well, that's a lot cheaper than bringing the canisters. But then I, you know, I either forget to do it or I don't want to weird people out. So I think I'd, it would, could you imagine doing like breath of fire next to somebody on an airplane? Yeah, or yeah. like, uh, stewardess? <laughs> I mean, I'm already such a train wreck on flight. I mean, the shit that I got my, you know, my um, heating pad, my, you know, uh, Robbie. Uh, yeah, I have my Therasage heating pad. I got my... <laughs> Robbie's awesome. I got my Blue Shield EMF thing plugged in if I have an outlet. Um, what else? I mean, it's just ridiculous. All my supplements, because flying just wrecks me. So I, I do like 50 things per flight to just feel halfway normal when I land. So, yeah. yeah. Luckily, Allison is super chill. Um, I, I have taken trips with partners in the past that found my whole operation to be really embarrassing and annoying yeah because they because they feel embarrassed for me because they're with me and everyone's looking like <laughs> i got my fucking emf hood on like the whole it's just a whole ridiculous production so i i don't blame them for their embarrassment oh my god that slays me <laughs> yeah it's it's really quite a spectacle but you know you got to do what you got to do i mean i'm sitting there and other people are like drinking cocktails eating that crappy food and they seem to feel fine i'm like i don't know what how people do it we'll see how that plays out over time right and the other thing is you know your body sorts for survival not necessarily for performance right so those people despite what they may or may not think they're probably not doing their degree of acuity any favors by virtue of imbibing their body you know with alcohol and then hammering it with you know glyphosate laden wheat which is already inflammatory right. like it, it, it kind of depends on what you're shooting for, right? Like, yeah, I mean, you can survive and like, I'm vegan. I eat only Cheetos and drink Coke. Okay, fair. Maybe right. you should set the bar slightly differently, but but whatever. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, what are you shooting for? Right? That's true. I think that is very true because my bar for baseline is probably higher than your average person because there's been times where 100%, all the things yeah. I'm doing are working really well and I feel freaking amazing. So anything less than that, yeah, well, you're, it's like an athlete, right? Like I work with I work with a lot of Olympic athletes, and those guys, dude, they're specimens, right? Like they are working on such minuscule little bitty things. Like I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing! You're already at this level, and they're like, right, but, and they're they're looking for something that will, you know, in the case of the pole vaulters, give them an extra centimeter, right? <laughs> they're already jumping like 20, <laughs> right. 20 ish feet. Like uh, okay, dude, whatever, yeah. that half inches gonna make a big difference but to them it's a huge thing right like or right. you know wrestlers or whatever their particular thing is they're looking for such minuscule little variations and gradations that like it's a big deal you're looking for performance at a different level i i am too i mean that's mentally why i'm constantly amping up my own mitochondria is because i want to be humming along at a really freakish pace you know i got a lot of stuff to do you know they're, they're like the world is the world is not short on problems. You know, I don't, I don't expect at any point yeah. soon that either of us will run out of things that we can contribute to, <laughs> you know, probably not in our lifetime. Is there anything new coming down the pike from wizard sciences that uh, we should be aware of? Um, I think I'm aware you, you got yeah, the I mean, hair so, serum coming. Yeah. The skin uh, one. Skin is out. What, what about the thing you were telling Allison for cats? Oh yeah, it's, is that out? No, it's not. But ah. it's it, it too. I'm trying not. One of the things that I decided was I literally have so many things on the shelf that are either curative or incredibly beneficial for lots of different things. But it's kind of hard to get stuff out, right? So I like devoted 2024. I was like, okay, I'm going to commit to getting a ton of stuff out, right? Like these things. It's great to have figured it out, you know, woohoo, gold star, but it doesn't really do a damn bit of good if it's sitting on my shelf and not actually helping anybody. And so like the derma, I, I just saw a testimonial that was awesome because the, the guy had had a skin condition for like a year, was having to take antihistamines, had itching, um, and within a week it was gone, right? And it's basically, it's just like modulation of mitochondria and drop inflammatory response. It's kind of like same basic, skill set you know but applied to a different thing um so the feline stuff is same sort of thing right like cats are obligate carnivores right now i have a product called vortex which is for animals 
but cats are obligate carnivores. So the profile that you want them to ingest is a little different, right? So I went back and retooled everything to be specific for cats. And so it's being tested right now. So I've Does sent it obligate out. obligate carnivores in felines differ from canines because canines canines in the wild like wolves will eat some plants or tubers or yeah, something exactly. if they're around yeah. oh, okay. like, like cats, cats really will only eat meat cats need to be eating the meat they have to eat meat that's like, crazy yeah like that, a, a that dog makes me can so sad when things. you see people making their cats be vegan yeah that's not a terribly natural thing brutal yeah that it's like, it's, it's going it's like to end abusive. poorly i mean you can it, it is actually right <laughs> you know i mean i suppose you could have a vegan great white but uh, you know i don't know how that would play out over it's time. a lot of spirulina <laughs> <laughs> a lot of algae <laughs> good luck with that hey i you like know. to think of him as a pseudo whale you know right, it's right. like there there are just certain things that animals need right and we're we're in that mix too but yeah with cats because they're obligate carnivores they have to eat that stuff so i figured okay i'm going to retool the animal stuff so that it's specific to them and more beneficial for them cool and then yeah and then the nmn supplement and then the quantum charge supplements and the reason i'm doing those is because it's kind of like the the frequency cards right like you can imprint a, a frequency card with say vitamin c or something like that and that's great and it does make a difference but you're still a physical creature right you know it's like my joke about imprinting a, a thing that says water you still are probably going to have to hydrate a little unless you're at the point where it, it doesn't matter and and if you're at that point no need to have this discussion you know but Ultimately, since you're in a body, you need certain vitamins and nutrients. And I figure if I can leverage the things that I know that actually make them better per unit volume, then you need less of a foreign substance to elicit the same response. So it's kind of hitting that like sweet spot of the minimum effective dose easier with less load on your biology. So cool. Yeah. Man, well, as always, great to catch up with you. Dude, yeah, this was great, actually. I mean, literally, I, yeah, we could probably just, we would be doing the exact same thing if the cameras were not on 100%. and the mics weren't rolling. And those are the those are the best episodes when it doesn't feel like a podcast, when it's just like sharing ideas, sharing yeah. space. Uh, so you guys go check out wizardsciences.com. Use the code Luke. And thank you for joining me again. I Much love, to man. See you. Yeah, it was great to see you. You too, brother. Mm -hmm.